joining us again today uh, on the second day of this workshop on innovating financing instruments. We had a, a very productive and substantive day yesterday, and we're hoping that we'll have another one today. Uh, we'll, we've organized the, 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 the day or this session in, in, into three panels. The first one on credit rating agencies, the second one on development banking, and the third one on macro policy, financial flows, and development. Uh, so let me hand over uh, the floor to uh, Hamouda Shakir. Thank you, Hamouda, for being here, for chairing this first panel. Hamouda is a uh, director in the government advisory uh, group at uh, Lassard. Is that uh, yeah, correct, exactly Lassard? Right. Yeah. Okay. Uh, he joined Lassard in 2006, and he has intervened since then on a variety of financial transactions involving sovereigns, banks, and major corporates. So he's, uh, so to speak, a practitioner. He knows what he's talking about. Uh, over the years, Hamuda took part in major negotiations with official creditors, including the IMF, the World Bank, European Commission, the ECB, etc. Uh, he's a graduate from uh, the Harvard Kennedy School, where he was an Arthur, Scholars, uh, Arthur Sachs scholar and uh, has taught at the Paris School of Economics at that we call National de Statistique de l'Administration Economique in Paris. Is that right? Uh, and many other things. Uh, just to say that, that you're an expert, you know, you know what you're talking about. We're very glad that you're here with us. And uh, the floor is yours so that you can, uh, you know, steer this first uh, panel. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, uh, Martin. And thank you very much for, for giving me the opportunity to, 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 to chair such an interesting panel and, and, and accompany such distinguished speakers. I have to say I am extremely interested uh, in the topic that it that that we will be going to be discussing um, uh, for the next uh, for the for the next uh, hour and so, because I first I think I think it's extremely timely. Over the last weeks, we have seen, uh, notably coming out of Africa, several calls from uh, politicians, from economic leaders, calling for alternative. Uh, voices uh, to the to the rating agencies. I mean, the latest that we've seen is President Nana of Ghana, who, in his inaugural speech at the African Union, called for uh, for an African rating agency and called for um, a way uh, to the definition of a way to uh, address the kind of monopoly that the three um, uh, major rating agencies have and the ability uh, that they have and the, the power that they have to somehow define, define the, 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 the economic future and to contribute to the economic future uh, um, of entire economies. Uh, we have seen in the past, uh, uh, and there have been major debates, uh, including in Europe, around the weight and the the cause and impact of rating agency uh, rating, rating rating actions on uh, market shutdowns to major economies. This was the case of Greece, for example, in, at the time of the Euro, of the Euro eurozone crisis in twenty in in, in twenty ten. And actually, in the case of Europe, this is what led to a reflection in Europe around the creation of a regional rating agency. And this is how we how we saw, for example, the rating agencies like Scope emerge, uh, the German rating agency. And actually, it's very timely in that perspective as well, because we are about to see Scope being accepted as a rating agency by the European Central Bank. So it also shows the time it takes and the institutional process for rating agencies to become credible, to be accepted by major players like central banks. With that uh, the short introduction, I would like to introduce uh, the speakers that we have today. First, um, um, as, uh, Professor Susan Schroeder, who, whom, um, who will uh, give us the privilege of, of, of presenting her paper and her work on, the, on, 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 on this topic. Uh, so Professor Schroeder is a senior lecturer in political economy at the University of Sydney. She has uh, an extensive academic uh, uh, career um, uh, in the US, in Germany, New Zealand, uh, and Australia. Uh, she has also uh, private sector experience, having worked with the, um, at the, the market research firm Tone Aller, and she is an expert in uh, topics such as financial fragility, country and sovereign risk, heterodox fiscal and monetary policies, uh, a history of economic thought, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. 
So following okay. uh, Professor Schroeder's uh, presentation, uh, we'll have a Sherry Sp Spiegel who will, um, um, who will comment on this paper and um, on, on this presentation. So Sherry is the chief of the policy analysis and development branch um, at, the UN, at, the, at the UN Department of Economic and Social Affairs. She also has a very rich and diverse career having worked in the private sector and the asset management industry, um, in the investment and advisory uh, industry, as well as, as well in the, uh, in the, in the, in the multilateral uh, system. Following um, um, Sherry Spiegel's uh, comments, we will also have Professor Stockhammer uh, from, um, uh, from King's College in London, who will also be commenting on this paper and bringing his perspective. He is an expert in macroeconomics and uh, in development finance and, 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 um, uh, and, 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 and growth uh, and growth theory. And finally, uh, we will also have the privilege of listening to Professor Dimsky, who is um, an, a professor of applied economics at the university uh, at, at Leeds University's uh, business school, and who's also an expert on these topics. So without further ado, uh, let us welcome uh, um, Professor Schroeder and mm -hmm. give her the, the floor for her presentation on, okay. the, on, on the rating agencies topic. Okay, thank you, Hamuda. Um, I'm gonna begin sharing screen, All right? Okay, I'm now sharing screen. So I have uh, three uh, pieces of material. One is the PowerPoint, of course, and then I have a link to um, Harvard's Atlas of Economic Complexity. And I'm gonna show you uh, one of the maps that I had been uh, 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 thinking about uh, when I was um, uh, looking to set the orientation of this agency, right? So I wanna thank um, folks, uh, first of all, for allowing me to engage with your project and for allowing me to uh, um, extend my own research through it. I have written on uh, public credit rating agencies at the national level and so this gave me the opportunity to think about what a multilateral credit rating agency might look like. Um, I hadn't talked about that in the book on public credit rating agencies, although I had mentioned it and the possibility of placing it um, at the UN. So, uh, right. Um, before we sort of launch into this, um, I do wanna pick up this, um, this uh, quick question that I had posed at the end of last session. Um, and uh, this might give some idea about um, uh, the urgency for an agency like this. We had been chatting prior to the start of the session about the urgency for it, and this might also ramp up the urgency for it. Um, I had been noting down here in Sydney that there had been some bond fund managers departing. And we also had the, um, oh, the deputy, deputy director of, um, Deputy Governor, excuse me, of the RBA, Reserve Bank of Australia, uh, he suddenly departed. Uh, he was supposed to be uh, assumed the governorship next year. And within, uh, he gave an announcement, he was leaving within a week. And so folks are like, what's going on? And uh, particularly with this, the bond industry. And so recently there was an article in the financial press down here as to, uh, which would give a hint as to why these folks are leaving. Uh, so this is coming from the Australian Financial Review. And uh, this is Vimal Gore, who was fixed income manager for uh, the Pendo Group. And he quote uh, says, quote, uh, bonds won't exist in 10 years. The trillions of dollars of bonds we have won't trade because we're moving to a world where central banks will set interest rates for people by a central bank digital currencies, All right? Um, so towards the end, he, he replicates that comment and he says, it's going to be a world where governments won't be talking about bonds. They'll be using a different lending protocols to raise money. All right, so um, the multilateral credit rating agency um, uh, could be uh, some uh, uh, mechanism, some agency or institution where you could suss issues like this. Yeah, where you have the, um, the, um, uh, this challenge of what happens when central banks have the ability to issue 
directly to individuals and governments don't need the bond market. Well, it's not that lending won't happen, but someone's got to evaluate what's, what the credit risk is on that lending. And so it could be that the uh, credit rating agencies have some challenges ahead. And it could be that they already are thinking about this in the way that they're extending their services. Um, so yeah, yeah, but this would be a space where the UN could uh, think about the, um, uh, the implications of comments like this. And, um, right, so multilateral credit rating agency. So it took me a while to get my head around what um, the structure and orientation of it should be. There were two key objectives that I was given. Uh, one was to improve and stabilize credit risk assessments of sovereigns, particularly for emerging markets, developing economies. That was one. And then two is to facilitate sustainable development goals, SDGs. All right. And as I'm thinking about these objectives, I'm realizing that they have to be accomplished in the context of climate change, right? Um, you may or may not be aware that Australia has had some pretty severe climate change events. Uh, a couple of years ago, we had the, uh, the forest fires, yeah, and uh, both on both sides of uh, Australia. Uh, last year and this year, we've had severe flooding, this year in particular, and we've had two 100-year um, uh, events in the span of a couple of months, and we're looking at possibly a third shaping up. So the insurance industry is a little bit shaken because of the number of claims for people who had their, ho their homes destroyed. And so, yeah, this, anything that we do going forward, whether it's a credit rating agency or, or any type of institution now has to really be thinking about um, climate change because it's here. All right, so um, the two key objectives. Now I do have about 15 slides and I don't have that much time. So I'm gonna have to jump to the chase on some of these things. Um, improving credit risk assessments of sovereigns. Um, well, looking at validation, the current methods and revisions used by credit rating agencies. Uh, yes, they put their methods online, but they don't put all the, all the details of those methods online because those details are where they make their money. That's proprietary information. So I don't think that there's been a good um, study, uh, which or comprehensive study about validating their methods, right? And then we also have this issue of lengthening time horizons on sovereign debt, particularly for EMDEs, right? And for facilitating sustainable development goals, there has to be importance for climate conditions as they relate to industrial configuration and performance. Um, I note in my paper, but I'm not gonna have time here, uh, that not, not all activities which contribute to social wealth um, are um, productive, you know? So um, not activities contribute to social wealth, right? Some of the uh, activities in GDP are uh, non-productive in that they simply transfer titles. They don't create new goods and services. So that means the GDP indicator might not be as good an indicator as we think it is for evaluating uh, economic robustness of an economy. Yeah. All right, and uh, yeah, so this is just reiterating a comment I've already made, so I'm not gonna go there. All right, so the challenge of timelines. All right, what is the timeline problem? Um, I noticed, and Disa also um, had discussed this. Uh, basically, the, the timeline problem is the following. Uh, credit ratings create information for investors. We know this. Now, their target audience is professional investors. They're not interested in the small investor or the mom and pop investor. Moreover, they're not interested in all professional investors, but just a sub-segment of them. Uh, that sub-segment has a three to five year horizon for their investments, yeah? All right, so long-term ratings of the rating agencies, no surprise, um, employ timelines of three to five years in length. So they're tailoring their assessments to uh, that particular sub-segment of investors. There are investors who would like to have ratings with longer term horizons. Who are these folks? Uh, these folks are pension funds, hedge funds, and insurance companies, right? Uh, investors with longer time horizons, um, what do they do? Uh, they do what they can in-house, okay? They do invest in infrastructure projects, but they don't have the support on, from assessment from the rating agencies. So they do what they can in-house for credit risk assessment and mitigation 
and then they cross check the work as best they can with the rating agencies. Yeah. Um, I do note that the rating agencies do put up a method, and I'm thinking of Moody's, on um, project finance. All right. And when I look at that method, um, I was noting that uh, there's not a lot of weight given to how project finance, uh, um, um, how risk is mitigated with project finance. All right. So they could do it with interest rate swaps. They could do it with um, uh, exchange rate swaps. They could do it with insurance policies on uh, political events, yeah, that's Aon. And um, yeah, yeah, so there's there's ways that they can mitigate risk, but they don't have um, um, a source that they can cross check uh, what they do in house. And EMDE should be have longer time horizons on their sovereign ratings because of the state of their development. They often will have infrastructure projects at the forefront of their economic development. And uh, if their uh, risk is mitigated properly, the uh, uh, rate of default on those projects will actually be quite low, which means that if they're relying heavily on those projects for growth, um, they, um, they're probably safer uh, than the rating agencies might concede. All right, so challenges of longer horizons. There was a suggestion from DISA uh, about extending the current ratings methods through fan charts and scenario analysis. That's a possibility. I think that's a good start. Um, the suggestion, however, is contingent on agreement about the underlying equations and assumptions involved in the creation of fan charts. So um, for LARC, um, I took um, as a module um, through EDX, the IMS uh, module on public debt dynamics under uncertainty. And when I looked at the equations, I'm like, I don't think these equations are suitable for EMDEs. These are actually suited for advanced economies. So should the equations and assumption have to vary to suit the EMDEs, the associated rating scale must differ from the scale for advanced economies. Otherwise, the EMDEs are disadvantaged. Yeah. So, um, yeah. All right, so the orientation of a multilateral credit rating agency. So I really, it, this took me a while. And I, I simply jumped in and I said, the environment has to be given a prominent role in this because credit risk is going to depend more and more on how productive activities are dependent on how climate change occurs, how it unfolds. Yeah, there's no way around it. So let's just work with it, All right? So in this way, um, by giving the environment a prominent role, um, attention is focused on how climate change has been, is, and will be influencing performance of firms or industries and ultimately sovereigns. Sovereigns have to try to manage this all, and they're going to be needing funding to do it. Uh, the achievement of sustainable development goals can be addressed much more directly, right? And as I look through this layering process, um, I don't have a mapping program here, but I have a, an idea of what could be mapped. And I'll show you some of my ideas um, as we could um, uh, adjust Harvard's Atlas of Economic Complexity. All right, um, the orientation could easily accommodate approaches to economic development. And, um, and I happened to see uh, UNDISA's recent meeting uh, on YouTube. I think the upload was dated March. I'm not sure exactly when the, the meeting happened. But Jeffrey Sachs was there. And towards the end, he makes a really um, 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 some key comments. Uh, he notes that the rating agencies are in the business of creditworthiness, of evaluating creditworthiness. They are not in the business of evaluating economic development, right? And so at the heart of their methods, they do not have a, um, uh, a clear uh, framework of economic development. And the MCRA uh, could accommodate that, I think, right? And yeah. All right, so this is the orientation. And I'm gonna start to bring up a couple of supporting illustrations here. And sorry for the denseness of this uh, particular slide. All right, so I began with um, botanical regions. I'm very interested in the range of vegetation rather than simply meteorolog meteorological changes, excuse me, um, that you can get here with the UN maps or climate change classifications. And I think it's the World Bank which uses the, this map. Yeah, the, the Kirpin Geiger map. Uh, this raw I like very much. It does capture the range of vegetation. However, you 
probably noting that it is rather dated. Uh, the Hunt Institute in the States releases this. They released both editions. And, um, and when I contacted them for an update, uh, they mentioned that the update is being uh, performed by a team in France. And I contacted the team in France, and they have been promising me an update for months, but it hasn't come through. So, um, but anyway, I'll show you what I saw. And um, yeah, yeah. So, anyway, oh, uh, yeah, change in vegetation will indicate how various species are faring in challenges faced by indigenous population. And once you have the, the regions, you can think about the countries as embedded in the regions, All right? All right, and then once you have that, your head around that, then you wanna be thinking about industrial configuration and sprawl and firm concentration across the regions. All right, so this is not so far-fetched. I'm gonna show you what Harvard's done. Harvard's actually done this in terms of trade activity, but they haven't, I would like to see it done on productive activities generally. All right, so let me show you the two things that I have been working with. So um, this is a map of Brazil, all right? And I'll show you more about the, uh, the, the range of uh, segmentation of the regions and subregion. Um, oh, oh, okay. Okay, and I think that'll slip away in just a second. All right, so this is Brazil. And you see here that Brazil has multiple regions within it, okay? And, and the vegetation is segmented according to uh, the regions. This is not such a, um, uh, a hairy um, um, or difficult mapping exercise, okay? Um, I'm sure that it has been done in the last 20 years. There are maps which can do this. Um, I just would like to have the uh, Brummett version because I like that one uh, very much. But so Chile will also have its, its, its range, the states will have its range. Some countries are very small and they're only nestled with one, within one bioregion or subregion, All right? So that's, that's the mapping of this particular, um, of the vegetation. And then we have, um, right, Harvard. Let me see if I can get Harvard up here, come on. I may have to bring this back up. Um, uh, the Atlas of Economic Complexity. All right, so this I love. Um, and when I do my country disk unit here at the University of Sydney, we love these maps. All right, so this is what I was looking at. All right, so I'm just gonna hover, well, maybe you just go to explore to it. All right, so over here you can choose the country. And you may have seen this, some of you may have seen this, so my apologies if I'm sort of going through things that you've already seen before. Um, so this is all done for trade. I mean, you know, this, people have just seen Brazil. So what's Brazil like? Come on. My mouse is really sensitive, so I have to be really careful about how quick I do that. What did Brazil export in 2019? All right, so the exports will definitely be different from the gross value added. All right, I was checking this um, with a couple of countries. So uh, Brazil's biggest import is soybeans. Yeah, so it's broken down by the, uh, the um, each block within this totality of exports. You have, um, according to uh, their specialization, so petroleum, oils, crude, and then you have iron ore concentrates, unspecified transport, travel, and so on. And then over here, let me just pull this here. Once you have that, and I, you can, we can do that very easily for productive activities, and then have a look at the, uh, product space. All right, so this is how the activities relate to each other. All right, so um, the grayish nodes, these are activities that they don't do. We well, have the purple node here, this is silicon and rare gases. All that relates to other metals. Yeah, and then we have petroleum oils. And um, yeah, and that uh, is not related too much to much of anything else, but then we have hydrocarbons here. So yeah, Brazil's really quite interesting in terms of diversity, but there's not really a lot of well-connectedness within the industries. Um, we could do this and you could sprawl it across the regions. So once you have the landscape of vegetation, you could do a map like this, which sprawls the regions, the, the industries across the, uh, the regions. And that will give you how the industries are nestled within the vegetation, how the industries are supporting the communities, the, um, 
um, the indigenous population. Yeah, and it will give you a sense of how when the regions shift in terms of climate change, how the uh, embedded industries are gonna be impacted, how the communities will be impacted, indigenous cultures and the, uh, the animal species which are resting within the um, yeah, region. All right, and so that- Schroeder, is just, yeah. just conscious of time, we have about okay, gotcha. four to five minutes left. Uh, okay, yep, okay, so let's get into it. So that's what I'm thinking of. Um, okay, so organization. So this is the managerial organization of this um, agency, directors, analytics division, special projects division, communications, support division, advisory committee. So this is a managerial composition and basic layout. The, the uh, thrust of the knowledge is gonna be generated by the analytics and the special projects divisions. All right, monitoring the regions. Okay, so we break down the globe into the regions and then the regions have their sub regions and then uh, each region has a supervisor and then uh, we assume that eight regions are active. Now within the region, you have a supervisor, which is gonna coordinate the teams. You have teams of four to five analysts and you have a team leader um, um, designated within each team. Of course, Europe would have five teams. Africa would have 10 teams. Temperate would have, Temperate Asia had nine teams and so on. And analytics division. All right, so I'm, this is sort of summarizing what I just talked about. Um, the segment according to the botanic regions around the globe. Countries are then allocated to the regions. Regions are segmented into subregions or areas. Most countries entail one botanic region. Big countries have more than one. All right, so I thought this would be interesting because it facilitates conversation between the countries differently. Yeah. So while trade and finance linkages are important, so are linkages between cultures, communities, and by a regional locale. The conversations between countries are oriented differently. Countries' competitiveness via trade and finance is overridden by the need to be cooperative to protect botanical regions, cultures, and communities. All right, so they're gonna compile data, maps, other visualizations, and basic analysis related to creditworthiness of sovereigns. All right, we're gonna start with the sovereigns. And then uh, techniques include checklists, scorecards, just the basic stuff, all right? And yes, we can do the fan charts and checklists of assessments. Um, and yeah, we can start thinking about widening the, um, the time horizon with those fan charts. And yeah, so the analytics division is monitoring economic health financing conditions of industry sectors and sovereigns in a more holistic way. And the MCRA has tremendous advantage with links to other UN entities. All right, the special projects division, this investigates issues as agreed upon by the MCR, a director, manager of analytics and its own manager, the special, Projects Division does the validation studies and delves into uh, creditworthiness and defaults, debt sustainability, financialization, inequality, and facets of sustainable development, climate change, and impacts of central bank digital currencies. I added that real quick. Um, yeah, so it suggests a wide variety of expertise and a really neat um, microcosm for multidisciplinary research. Um, right, funding of it. How would we get this up and running? The initial funding of the MCRA could be raised through grants from UN uh, and contributions of sovereigns and central banks. It needs to shift quickly towards self-sustaining state. All right, we'll talk about that in just a sec. Um, I think it's possible by reverting back to the old subscription model rating agencies used to rely on for revenue. Uh, the fee for a subscription could be set on a sliding scale according to firm size and locale. And the key to funding is create a body of work that can be used as a basis for subscription service. All right, so funding example. Uh, one of the stakeholders of the MCRA is the insurance industry. All right, as per Statista, there are approximately 13,000 insurance companies in the states in Europe alone. 13,000 in states in Europe. If the average annual subscription rate for an average, for an annual report, um, quarterly updates, and a newsletter was 2,500 US, the revenue from the US and Europe alone would amount to 26 million. Um, I costed a skeletal structure of the MCRA and that's estimated to be about five to seven million. The next level of expansion is 24 to 26 million, All right? So um, there's, 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 I think there's fruit here, um, low, um, low hanging fruit and uh, that which could be um, uh, helpful fund this and take the pressure off the UN. All right, so um, I'm mindful of this beast. Um, this is the International Nonprofit Credit Rating Agency. 
This was a uh, nonprofit rating agency created by the Bertelsmann Foundation in 2012 as an alternative to private credit rating agencies. Their idea, their main focus was to improve credit rating accuracies by reducing the influence of conflict of interest in the issuer pays model. All right, they're very concerned about it. Their initial funding was structured as an endowment sourced from contributions by governments, NGOs, civil society foundations, and financial services industry. They couldn't maintain the funding. One of the problems was that the ratings it generated were not distinctive enough from the ratings of the credit rating agencies. Well, that makes sense. If they're generating the same information, why is, would a country you know, buy the same information twice? You know, so it makes sense that they would lose interest in this. So the MCRA needs to be distinctive to survive, all right? So I think that um, the structure here is, is distinctive. It would be hard to replicate by the credit, the credit rating agencies. But I think if that bond comment at the start is, um, is gonna play out, the rating agencies have got a bit more on their plate than competition from this little MCRA. All right, so the challenges for the MCRA is the financing structure. And we talked about that. Um, regulatory capture. I think I've structured this agency so that regulatory capture is minimized. Yes, um, it would. Um, it will sit alongside well with private credit rating agencies, but it, it will have enough oomph to it that the rating agencies won't have the incentive to try to replicate it and leave, you know, and walk away from the table. Um, right, support innovative ways to service government debt. Now, in the draft, I, I uh, alluded to a wealth tax on gross assets. Uh, most wealth taxes that I've seen are um, uh, based upon net assets. So debt often has tax implications. There's often, often tax breaks to it. So people use it quite a bit. And as they use it quite a bit, um, they lower their net assets and lower the effectiveness of um, a tax on assets. So put a tax on gross assets, it turns out it's actually quite modest. You know, I think for the States, it was 0.2% of assets. For Australia, it was 0.1%. So this is just a- Professor Schroeder, unfortunately, we will have to, to conclude. No. We will have to conclude okay. now. Yep. Okay, yep, okay. Okay, and then convincing governments and other stakeholders to incorporate its evaluations. All right, so that's it. Um, thank you very much for the- with a, um, thank you. Thank you very much. That was extremely interesting. I think, and and very rich, uh, very rich material. Um, we will now turn to the uh, to our distinguished panelists, who who I'm sure have a lot of, to comment on. The first um, the first area um, that that we would like to explore here um, is, in, and we heard a lot of things in your presentation about the you know uh, the challenges that credit agencies are confronted with in in, in the risk assessment. Uh, you said that the uh, structural transformation with the with the introduction of um, central bank uh, uh, digital currencies um, uh, uh, brought some challenges. You mentioned the fact that um, um, rating agencies uh, evaluated credit worthiness and not economic development, and um, that uh, um, uh, it, it, all that 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 you know that that refers to the to the point that risk assessment is uh, is not fully captured and that there needs mm. there, there is a need for an improvement in the, in the risk assessment by rating agency, agencies. Mm -hmm. So on that particular point, uh, I would like to hear um, uh, Sherry Spiegel and her view on, on, on the ways uh, to address this um, risk assessment overhaul and how to make it better better captured by rating agencies and by an institution like the MCRA. Sherry, the floor is yours. Great, thank you so much. Um, and thank you, Susan, for that very interesting presentation in the paper, which I enjoyed reading. Um, I think maybe to take a step back um, is the question of what, um, what, is, what are we trying to fill with the rating agency? What are they supposed to be doing? Um, so, and, what, and, and then that sort of goes to the question of what impact they have versus what we would expect them to have. So, and basically there's some sort of market gap where information on credits wasn't, everybody doesn't have it. So we're supposed to all be able to invest equally. And yet there may not be enough information in the market to better understand what the credits are of either sovereigns or corporates. And so the idea would be that this is meant to fill that gap 
to help make the market more effective and more efficient, including to do things like we know that. And one of the interesting things when we were looking at credit rating agencies was to try to understand the difference between market forces that would exist whether or not rating agencies existed and the impact of the rating agencies themselves. So there's pro-cyclicality, there may be very high costs of borrowing for developing countries, um, but would that exist without rating agencies? Is this market forces and the rating agencies are following or are the rating agencies leading this? And so, and the goal of a rating agency should be to help dampen pro-cyclicality because it's providing a service, a, a good, a public good in terms of information, it should help make these more efficient, reduce um, biases and reduce pro-cyclicality and volatility. And so the question really is, are they playing that role? And if not, how do we better fill that gap so that markets can act more effectively, efficiently, and not have biases and, and reduce pro-cyclicality and um, reduce um, volatility? Um, so we, we looked at a bunch of studies and saw that um, in general, studies show that sovereign ratings lack market prices. And I will say, <laughs> when my old, once upon a long time ago, when I was investing actually at Lazard, as was, was one of my, um, when I was investing in emerging markets, um, they, um, you know, we didn't look at ratings very seriously. So we did our own in house analyses, and our goal was to be smarter and better than the ratings, and that's how we outperformed for our clients. So, or, or for our returns. So, um, the, and you can see that in the relationship between prices and ratings that, that sovereign ratings actually lag market prices. But nonetheless, um, negative warning announcements um, do increase the cost of borrowing. And so it's not the rating changes themselves, it's actually the, the, the warnings. And it's much worse for developing countries than for advanced economies. So the impact of a negative warning on average, and it can be worse or better in other specific cases, could be is 160 basis points for developing countries and 100 basis points for advanced economies. Um, and then the second question would be, as I mentioned, that I didn't, you know, when we were trading, the big investors don't really use these to guide their investment decisions. Nonetheless, they still have an important impact in several different ways. Um, one way is because they are sometimes hard-coded into regulations. They can be hard-coded into your, just your investment mandate that doesn't let you go below certain ratings. Or, and mo this is becoming more and more important, they are in, in indices. So when a inde index providers use the rating to set their indices and then managers manage against that rating, automatically the impact of the rating becomes more important. And that's particularly important as we have more and more passive investment strategies, which when I was investing were only 3% of the market in the 90s, and now are 41% of combined US mutual funds, for example, so, and, and ETFs in 2020. So the impact of ratings may actually, to that extent, become even more important. Um, of course, there are issues of volatility. We, um, there are cliff effects when you go from investment grade to sub-investment grade that a lot of these investors have to sell, that it can also lead to shifts in your weightings in the index, which can lead to forced selling as well. So that's a really big issue involved. That's not the rating agency's force fault per se, but has a big impact on the market. Um, the second issue is, are they pro-cyclical? We know markets are pro-cyclical. Are rating agencies more or less pro-cyclical? Um, and we certainly have evidence that they are pro-cyclical. So whether more or less, it's harder to tell. And I, I, I haven't seen good research on that. But there's certainly evidence that they are pro-cyclical, both in the Asian crisis as examples, um, and there's studies in Africa that show that they are. And particularly, as Susan mentioned, they have a relatively short time horizon, even though they may say they look through a cycle, they look through ups and downs of markets and try to look at a rating for a longer period of time. In um, actuality, their markets and forecasts go up to around three years. Um, and so, and as I mentioned, you know, the goal of this should be to dampen volatility as opposed to exacerbate it or do nothing. You know, just the goal should be they need to have some service to, to, to improve. I mean, the idea would be to actually dampen it. So now the question is, um, is um, and then the second issue that, that Susan also brought up and, and went into in detail, so I won't say that much about it, is the question of incorporating long-term risk factors into, into and particularly climate risk but other social and the SDG risks into ratings. Um, there is movement on that from the risk side, mostly for corporates though, and well, as well as for sovereigns. Um, but, um, and I have some data like 63 um, in 2019, 36% um, 
of Moody's rating adjustments of emerging market issuers were informed by, by particularly by climate. And so what we actually see is that the more we brought climate in, the, the more expensive actually it becomes for, for, for exposed countries to borrow. So there is this question of, you know, as we bring these risks in, the risks are already being incorporated, but what's not yet being incorporated would, I would say, would be investments in resilience, long-term investments in sustainability that could help countries respond to that. So we're having this, um, this unequal sort of incorporation that's not necessarily, um, that may be hurting sovereigns. And there's a whole set of separate set of issues on this on the corporates. Um, which, for example, corporate um, reporting, we don't even have good reporting on the impact of corporates on sustainability factors or the impacts of sustainability risks on corporates, but there's a lot of work going on, which we could talk about later, um, on trying to do that better. And this question of whether that should incorporate single materiality, which is less interesting, which is just the impact of risks on the countries on the companies or countries, which is what the rating agencies are looking at, but also this question of double materiality of how much those, those impact the um, environment, how much they impact the SDGs. And over time, those two things may merge. We've seen that in climate already because regulations are changing. Things that were thought for a long time ago not to be important for the, the, the one who's polluting, the one who has high carbon emissions, if we begin to have carbon pricing, within uh, is going to impact their bottom line. So, so there are a whole set of issues that we don't have time, I don't have time to go into right now, but I'm happy to discuss in more detail that we also work on associated with that and what that means. So let's go back to the solutions then, since I don't want to overstep my time. And we have two minutes left, Sharon. Two minutes. Okay, so I would just say quickly that sovereign ratings the, are very different from corporate ratings in the sense that they have a very, very big element of judgment. And there's a question of there's a data-driven portion and then a discretionary component, which is, the, which is the judgment. The CRAs say that that's the value of their sovereign ratings is their judgment. And so the first sort of recommendations would be to try to separate those. If we have a transparent way to look at the difference between them, that would be, we can at least begin to understand what are the, how much is this, this, this discretionary component coming from the sovereigns, coming from the rating agencies. And there's a big question of how technology will change the industry that we, I don't think has been discussed enough. So for example, um, the, 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 if you have model-based dri driven models that can do this, it'll, it could have a very big, especially for corporates that have a less component side, the industry could change dramatically. Now there's a problem in that because the rating agencies are oligopolies, they don't have an incentive to really change as much and to bring a lot of this information in. So that's one of the issues that some greater competition such as a public rating agency could address. I will say very quickly that one of the issues we talk about as Susan said, is this question of long-term ratings. And often when we talk to people, they say, um, well, how can the, the analysts predict long-term? And that's not what we're saying, as Susan said. In fact, when I started investing at Lazard, my boss said to me, the very first thing he said was, Sherry, if you're right 60% of the time, you're beating the market. And so yet we expect the credit analysts to be right 100% of the time, and they can't be. So rather than trying to predict the future, they, I would say they should be looking at volatility and looking at scenarios and, um, and um, fan charts, et cetera, to better understand what are the risks and which risks will hurt these different, um, different entities, the issuers in different ways, and to take that judgment part out as much as possible. Um, and so, um, and that includes both economic risks and non-economic risks such as climate. Um, another measure is of course to increase, increase better dialogue with the public sector. That's an issue that really came to the fore when we saw the way that ratings reacted to the DSSI. And the idea that they were really, there was a, a misinterpretation of what DSSI meant for credit ratings and the importance of having better, better dialogue. So finally, um, on the question of a public rating agency, um, I just want to note, and Susan mentioned these questions, that um, the first thing is that it's very, very difficult to increase competition before we even get to the rate, the public one. So a lot of these smaller rating agencies just that the newer ones that have come up have not been accepted by the markets. It's almost like in order to trust a rating agency, it needs to, its reputation is so important that it's very hard for new entrants to come in to create competition and why we keep ending up despite new entrants trying with this very limited model. So the set of, of only three, this oligopolistic model. So the question for public rating agencies 
as Susan mentioned, is there, there are questions of conflicts there as well. Will they be trusted by markets? What is the government structure going to look like? And I think these really need to be thought through. Um, in terms of funding types, I would just say that the, um, the, the, even the old one of fee for service subscriptions, rating agencies actually used to do that and they moved away from that model. And one risk with that model is that it will cut down on transparency for the rest for those, it, it actually could limit transparency as opposed to increasing it. So things that really need to be thought through. But the question is that all of these funding models end up unfortunately with their own set of conflicts of interest. Finally, one last comment on Susan's recommendations. I'm really, the one of the really interesting thing, uh, things about her recommendation, her, her public agency is that it goes beyond ratings. It looks at debt relief. It looks at a whole host of issues beyond the roles that credit rating agencies play right now. Some of those are other gaps in the system that could be very, very useful to have, to have um, um, measures, you know, in agencies or something to look into these. But I would just say that really the question comes down to political will. And so for all of these, almost more important than the details at this point in time is to understand, you know, what is the political will to be able to move forward? So with that, apologies if I went over and back to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sherry. That was very, very interesting. I mean, we learned a lot on, you know, all the uh, or shortfalls that that uh, that uh, one can identify in the in the in the structure and the functioning of the rating agencies and the way they're they're not adapted to the to the to the ongoing trends and to the ter long long term uh, challenges. Uh, let us now turn to uh, Professor Stockhammer, um, who will focus who will focus really on the uh, on the need for the uh, for, for for on why we absolutely need such a such a non private. Um, uh, cre credit agency. I personally have one question in that in that perspective, notably when it comes to so sovereign rating. That I, mean, I think that I would love to see Professor Stockhammer cover is that, by definition, in the multilateral system, the countries are the shareholders, and how can we overcome the fact that the shareholders are on the board of an agency that will assess? These, these same credits. So I hope you would cover part of it, Professor Stockhammer. And with that, I'll, the floor is yours. Okay, thanks for that. I hope you can hear me and see the slides. Uh, yeah, I'm, my comments will mostly be on the, uh, on the macroeconomic side. Uh, not so much, I'm afraid, on the design of a multilateral uh, credit rating agency. Uh, I, I overall uh, enjoyed the, the draft and agree with most of it. Uh, there's a few points where I push, where I would push further uh, than what Susan has done in her draft. And there's one point uh, where I will deviate a little bit from what she's saying. Uh, so first of all, uh, and that, uh, in, in a way, builds nicely on what, what Shari uh, just has said. What credit, credit, agent, credit rating agents are doing is they're advising uh, private financial institutions that want to ultimately want to maximize profits. And part of what uh, uh, Susan has done nicely uh, with the sustainable development goals is pointing out that, well, there might be other objectives and there, there needs to be a, a rating system that, that takes these into account. I wanna push that a little bit further and think of uh, what role macroeconomically the credit agencies are doing and in particular uh, that will lead us to the impact on uh, financial flows, international financial flows and the role that international financial flows are playing in business cycles. So my impression is that a lot of the criticism of the credit rating agencies is focusing, if you want, on the micro aspects. It's conflicts of interest, is that they are getting things wrong, that they have market power. Uh, uh, and as Susan nicely explains, they, they have a, a short time horizon don't have uh, an economic model built in that, that has financial cycles in there. My concern would be on the macroeconomic side that what they are doing is they are essentially amplifying market sentiment and thereby contributing 
uh, to cyclicality uh, in financial dynamics. Uh, it's worth briefly recalling the Euro crisis. Amuda has briefly mentioned it at the beginning. Now, initially, the ECB was using uh, credit ratings uh, to determine which uh, government bonds, meaning government bonds of which member states, uh, it would be holding. And thus, uh, that, that was essentially part of the package of uh, using financial market discipline to, uh, to, to force member states to adopt what are considered reasonable fiscal policies. Now, in the course of the Euro crisis, there was a crunch point where, when Greece was sufficiently downgraded, uh, the ECB essentially said, okay, this is too bad. We, we're not going to worry about those credit ratings anymore. We develop our own policy, which involves that essentially we want to uh, buy uh, members, its government's bond, and later that was qualified uh, that the, the, they have to have uh, 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 what became the Troika packages. Now, the key point here is that the, the agency is not only downgraded Greece, but they also started downgrading other European countries. So in other words, they amplified the crisis not only for Greece, but they also spread it to other countries, contagion. And that, in a way, that episode encapsulated that if you want to do public policy, if you want to have a guide for public policy, uh, ratings are not good because they are not taking account both the, the, the impact of the action in this case of the ECB, but also the, 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 the effect of social factors uh, that one would care about. And of course, that's a situation that's even amplified for a lot of developing countries that are really reliant on international credit. Uh, so where I would want to uh, reinforce that argument uh, is that Credit rating agencies have an impact on capital flows. I'm uh, citing here one uh, particular World Bank study that, that documents that capital flows respond uh, to ratings. And uh, I'm not citing anything, but Sherry has actually nicely argued it. There is a pro-cyclicality pro in their argument, uh, sorry, in, in, in the ratings. Now, if that is the case, then of course the question is, well, if the ratings are pro-cyclical and if they have an impact on capital flows, then the question is, well, what's the role of capital flows in the economic cycles in developing an emerging market economy? Now, if you look at the literature on uh, financial cycles or economic cycles more general since the global financial crisis, there's a big shift in attention uh, to financial cycles, in particular the work by the, the BIS, Claudio Borio, and, and various co-authors. And what that literature typically finds that is that you have uh, two peaks in, in the uh, cyclical space, one corresponding to a relatively more standard business cycle, five to seven years, and then you have a medium frequency of 10 to 15 years. So what, uh, and uh, the Eidosoro et al. paper, which is uh, one of the BIS papers that's particularly relevant for developing countries, then calls the short one, uh, statistically shows that the short one is more related to uh, what they somewhat misleadingly potentially call the global financial cycle, which is essentially American indicators, the weeks and things like that. Uh, so that's what Helen Ray would be, would be talking about. But then there's also a medium cycle, which I would analyze as coming out of the interaction between domestic factors, domestic demand, investment growth on the one hand and capital flows uh, on the other hand. So what you see on the right hand side is what, what you get when you do a spectrum density analysis in this case for Chile. And what you find is that GDP uh, has a cyclical peak uh, of around uh, 10 years uh, and if you look at exchange, sorry, of, of nine years, uh, and if you look at exchange rates, uh, that's very similar at around 10 years. Uh, so one way in which that's interpreted in the literature is that you have an interaction of these uh, capital flows uh, and, uh, and domestic factors, uh, that lending is pro-cyclically, uh, and to the right-hand side, you see tables of a recent paper, uh, of mining Carola, where we essentially fit uh, a Minsky model uh, where the tool 
arms of the, the Minsky model are on the one hand, real GDP growth, and on the other hand, uh, the real exchange rate. Uh, and what you get there is that the feedbacks are such that you do get uh, endogenous cycle. The system has uh, complex roots technically, but essentially you get a plus minus interaction uh, between GDP uh, and the real exchange rate and behind the, the exchange rate, uh, of course, are capital flows uh, and the fact that uh, they, they can be amplifying domestic cycles. So what that wants to illustrate is that three to five year window that the agencies are using are not fit uh, to, to capture the financial cycle. The values that we get here are between nine and 18 years, uh, depending on, on the controls that we use in there. So in other words, the, the credit rating agencies, because of their time horizon, in a way, can't be anything other than pro-cyclical with respect to the financial cycle, because the financial cycle is substantially longer than that. If they are pro-cyclical and if they do uh, uh, influence capital flows, then they are not just making a mistake, but they are actually part of what creates those capital flow cycles that are so painful for developing countries. Professor Stockhammer, we have two minutes left. Yeah, the final uh, point uh, as a commentator, I also have to find something where I disagree with the draft. So the point where I would uh, deviate a bit from Susan's analysis is in her discussion of unproductive industries. Uh, that is again about understanding long-term growth and based on classical political economy, Susan there uh, is distinguishing between productive industries, which include agricultural and mining and manufacturing, and then unproductive industries, which among other things uh, include finance. I have two objections to that. The first is uh, from a developing country perspective, it seems rather odd to me to mix agriculture and mining on the one hand with manufacturing. In particular, if it's a publication of SEPA, which has a lot of commodity uh, export dependence, uh, and that commodity exports tend to trap uh, technological development in developing countries. Uh, I, I would think that uh, the, the mixing together of, of commodities and manufacturing is not helpful. I'm also uh, concerned about uh, classifying finance in general terms uh, as unproductive. Now, obviously we've had the recent literature of too much finance uh, is uh, an IMF paper had called it and what in heterodox discussion is financialization. Uh, but the, the, I guess the point that I would want to emphasize is that the, the, the key question is what the financial sector does. Does it finance asset and foreign transaction uh, for an exchange transaction or does it finance long term real investment? So developing economies in some ways need larger financial uh, sectors, but they need a larger financial sector that A, is less reliant on capital inflows and B is more targeted towards uh, physical investment, manufacturing investment with long time horizons, which brings us to the issue uh, of, of development banks. So in that sense, I think it's more important to distinguish what the financial sector is doing than looking at the size and uh, it, classifying it overall is unproductive. But with that, uh, thanks to Susan for uh, an interesting and useful paper. Thank you very much, Professor Stock, Stockhammer. That was very interesting. And I think the, all your perspective on the, on the financial flows and capital flows and actually uh, the link with, 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 with the credit rating and um, uh, the causality there and the procyclicity is, 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 was very relevant. Professor Dimsky, the, the floor is yours now. I mean, it would be great if you, you know, uh, if you if you sh shed light a little bit, building on what all the, the previous speakers said on, you know, how to make the uh, risk the, the 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 risk assessment more flexible and to capture a broader set of uh, of indicators and and factors, including the social, the political, the long-term trends, the environmental, um, all the things that uh, the previous speakers said. Also, um, two points that I think would be would be important is in terms of structure of this multilateral credit agency, how can we avoid conflict of interest? 
how can we avoid regulatory capture? We would love to have your, your views on these aspects in terms of structuring and in terms of mandate for this multilateral credit uh, agency. I appreciate that. And uh, let me start. I, I'll focus my comments on trying to answer these questions, uh, implementing and financing a multilateral credit rating agency. I'm gonna call it MCRA, so sorry for that. The overwhelming case for an MCRA is actually the starting point for understanding what I think we have to do with implementation. Private CRAs have been a source of financial instability, especially in peripheral and developing economies, and they've asymmetrically impacted already marginalized populations that have been caught up in pandemics and natural disasters, as we heard yesterday. Private CRAs methods also are opaque, and they have an unavoidable moral hazard dilemma with clients who are focused on short-term financial returns and who we might note uh, with uh, gesturing to Engelbert's uh, uh, research here, who are caught up in, in, in cycles and, and have to respond to that. So there, these are perhaps irreducible barriers to the private CRAs contributing, not just to orderly repayment, but to global sustainability. And there will I'll take that broader mandate that you mentioned. Repayments mandates for EDAs, for, that's you know, economically uh, uh, emerging and developing economies, EDEs, have to be rethought. This brings us to activities. Now, Schroeder's chapter contemplates detailed MCRA structures and imperatives. She proposes several changes focused on borrower nations themselves. As uh, Engelbert mentioned, separating the fire sector from the rest of the GDP to try to identify something like a foundational economy, uh, better measuring the informal economy and unpaid work and so on. Now, I'm gonna turn instead, without getting into all of that, some suggestions for that focus on the global scale. Specifically, I think that the brief of the MCRA should encompass the relationship between credit commitments and the emerging and developing economies capacity to meet the sustainable development goals, the SDGs, and to contribute to climate tar to global climate targets. To achieve this, I end up with a different vision uh, than the, sort of kind of a broader vision that was put forth thus far. First, the MCRA staff must work collaboratively with appropriate policy officers in emerging and developing economies. They've got to be there. Also involved in this collaboration should be representatives of the multilateral financial institutions, the IMF and the World Bank, regional multilateral development banks, and officers of the UN agencies charged with implementing climate change and SDG agendas. A second point, this collaborative work should involve granular analysis of the social and economic factors underlying repayments obligations. So in, in some sense, as Sherry mentioned, there's other stuff here, but let's go beyond uh, that. I, th I think that we have to go beyond and really look on the ground at what's happening. These, the kind of things to look at would include fair share analysis of revenue streams, expenditure needs for human well-being, the enhancement of population resilience and capacity, infrastructure requirements, and so on. Now, including these social, ecological, and foundational economy criteria uh, among the criteria for monitoring and managing default risk uh, would be an expansion of the concept of value, something we've been working with uh, here regionally in West Yorkshire. How do we rethink or have multiple uh, denominations of value? Uh, now, one could do that using a loss function approach or else perhaps thinking of a social welfare function uh, as is sometimes used in, in micro. This would be a way of combining efficiency with sustainability and repayment. This collaborative approach should include training for host country policy officers that would include attention to prudential oversight framing and measuring the SDG and climate change activities and accountability mechanisms. Hyman Minsky in two Levy Institute policy briefs, 91 and 92, uh, argued that the Clinton administration's Community Development Financial Institutions Initiative, then being contemplated, should include the equivalent of a central banking slash development banking coordination training and guidance function for those institutions that were serving marginalized communities, the so-called inner city. 
His proposal was too visionary for that time. Finance in these, in these communities was left to unregulated players who started to make subprime and other predatory loans in those areas. 15 years later, of course, subprime crisis. My proposal above is based on Minsky's plan for, for trying to create a, a viable subsidiary circuit of capital in marginalized communities and MCRA that would adapt, but that would be then adapting this vision to current global circumstances. Now, how about financing and locating the MCRA? Schroeder's paper proposes here a structure of sovereign nation and central bank funding for MCRAs per se. She doesn't say much about it. Here too, I wanna to go a little further um, because you know, are you gonna pay for what you're going to get and there's problems with capacity, et cetera. Why not extend the logic underlying the United States 1977 Community Reinvestment Act to this global situation? Now that act uh, recognized that private lenders failure to provide credit and core banking services in segregated minority communities, especially in the US inner cities, contributed centrally to these areas stagnation. Now this is years before, right? The creation of the subprime loans and all of that. Uh, that act, this Community Reinvestment Act mandated that banks must meet the banking needs of its entire market area. This effort was monitored by the Federal Reserve and backed by a 1975 data disclosure law. Okay. So the idea there was that banks should more fairly serve their entire customer base. Let's extend the analogy. Today, we have a global developmental crisis embedded in a global environmental sustainability crisis. Many of the financial institutions identified in the BIS list of globally systematically important banks, the GSIBs, have in many cases only recently survived crises due to their host government subsidies. And these banks have participated in the main, in a variety of ways, uh, in contributing to financial instability and developmental crises in the EDEs. So the GSIBs should be required to pay a fee to support the budget of the MCRA and in the EDEs of officers who would work with planning and supporting the financing of SCG and climate initiatives. I think these banks should also be required to participate proportionally in providing the actual financing that EDEs require to meet their SCG and climate change goals. The blended finance mechanism highlighted in Glasgow, which asks multilateral banks and sovereign nations to de-risk their loans for these purposes, would put even more pressure on already impacted national fisks. In any case, the slow uptake of blended finance by private sector institutions leaves us well short of the $3 trillion requ annual requirement for meeting global goals. Credit for achieving sustainability in an unequal world must be shared and accelerated. Of course, the global soft law environment makes it difficult to visualize how such a mandate could be imposed. As Sherry said, there's a question of political will and that's global as well as local and national. Nonetheless, carrots as well as sticks should be considered to topic for further discussion. One suspects that as the climate crisis heightens, and as migration and sustainability and even food crises mount, uh, that we're gonna see the recognition of the need for true global action. Locating the MCRA with, therefore, where to, where to put the MCRA? Locating it within the orbit of the EDE serving units, that is the, uh, the developing economy serving units of the United Nations. We can think of UNDESA, UNCTAD, CEPAL, ECLAC, ADB, et cetera might assure maximum communication and knowledge transfer. That's another topic for further discussion. The final question is how to avoid regulatory capture and conflicts of interest. For this, I suggest we look to best practices worldwide in financial regulation. Some policies that could be uh, taken over, those that block revolving door employment, uh, wherein, for example, an MCRA employee might immediately work for a multinational bank, uh, we could imagine a strong code of ethics and, of course, a commitment to transparency in all actions. That would be, at the very least, a start. Thanks for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Dimsky. That was extremely relevant and, and interesting.
Um, I think with that, uh, we are about to conclude um, our, our very interesting panel. Thank you very much all for, for attending and for listening. Um, uh, and one, one word of conclusion and a thought for, for, for everyone is that um, we, the, the IMF has recently announced the setup, thanks to the uh, uh, recycling of SDRs of, uh, of the RST, of the Re Resilience and Sustainability Trust. Maybe part of its agenda, given that it's gonna look at things beyond the fiscal, the, the macro fiscal frameworks and projects that are, that to the financing of uh, economic uh, sectors uh, beyond the, uh, the, 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 the standard macro fiscal frameworks, part of that trust should, should finance uh, the creation of such, of, of, of such, of such, of such a multilateral credit agencies. Um, um, the, 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 these funds should serve to such a, to such a, such endeavors. With that, I don't know, Esteban, I'll give you the, the final word. Thank you very much for organizing such an interesting debate. Yeah, thank you very much to, to Susan for a great paper and, and presentation, which is a really very interesting. Uh, and to uh, Shari, Engelbert and Gary for, the, for their comments. And thanks to, to you, Hamura, for for the uh, agreeing to chair this very uh, important session. Uh, we will now uh, have a coffee break for about uh, 15 minutes, and then we will resume uh, with a panel on development banks. And after that, we will have a presentation of a paper linking that is relevant actually to the subject of um, uh, credit rating agencies linking uh, capital flows with uh, productive development. So thank you very much, and we will resume at uh, uh, 10 30. Right, thank you. Thank you.
Welcome back, everyone. It's uh, 1030. We will uh, begin the next session. Uh, before uh, beginning the next session, I just want to uh, provide some context of the uh, overall uh, workshop of the role of innovative financing instruments to build forward better in Latin America and the Caribbean. Uh, the idea of, the, of this uh, workshop was basically the fact that uh, uh, Latin American countries <laughs> face uh, an, imp an important shortage of liquidity and at the same time an increase in debt uh, that started actually after the global financial crisis, as in the case of most developing uh, economies, all developing regions experienced an increase in debt uh, from 2009 or perhaps 2007. And this was aggravated by the, by the pandemic. And uh, given uh, their uh, uh, degree of openness and of financial openness, which we saw in, the, uh, in that graph that uh, Engelbert Stockheimer saw between the exchange rate and GDP, which reflects actually that GDP is very tied to uh, the uh, external uh, financial cycle, uh, Latin American countries really have no other way to confront the situation but to adjust. Uh, and uh, the uh, situation with inflation has made this even worse. And the idea of the, uh, this, uh, uh, this workshop is to try to see what type of instruments and institutions uh, can be thought up, can, be, can we come up with in order to provide countries that cannot, for example, impose capital controls, as in the case of Chile because of free trade agreements, or have tied the, their hands uh, and have really no uh, policy space. The, the fact of the, the credit rating agencies and the impact of, credit, of the credit rating agencies is an example of uh, the constraint on fiscal policy. In fact, the down, credit downgrades are the main constraint to an expansionary fiscal policy in, in Latin America. And uh, if the, yesterday, we talked about the possibility of the reallocation of SDRs, innovative financing instruments like income linked bonds. Then uh, this morning about uh, credit rating agencies and the possibility of have, having a multilateral credit rating agency. And now we're going to another uh, dimension of the same problem, which is the role that development banks uh, can have in trying to provide liquidity and to, uh, to provide instruments and innovative instruments for countries to face uh, obstacles and uh, constraints and situations such as the one that they're facing today. So the, this panel uh, it will be chaired by uh, Daniela Prates. Uh, Daniela uh, Prates is Senior Economic Affairs Officer at UNCTAD and Associate Professor of Economics at the University of Campinas, Unicam Brazil. Her main areas of research are international economics and open macroeconomics. We focus on monetary and financial issues in developing countries. She has published widely many papers in academic journals, such as the Journal post keynesian Economics, the Review of Keynesian Economics, International Review of Applied Economics, and ECLAC Review, and also obviously have, have contributed several chapters to different books on the subjects, on these subjects. So we, with much further ado, I'm gonna give the floor to Daniela to chair uh, this round table on development banks. The floor is yours, Daniela. Many thanks, Esteban. Um, then it's a pleasure to, to chair this panel um, that we know, as Stefan uh, summarized, the, the whole, the, the crucial role of development banks in mobilizing uh, finance for development that is uh, the main topic of uh, this project, that, that the, the project that ANCTA uh, is coordinating and, and that I Clark are, are uh, a crucial partner uh, and also a topic that is very keen to work that as uh, Diana, one of the panelists will will talk about. Uh, and also uh, for me uh, it was one topic that I was of my previous res research uh, 
before joining um, UNCTAD. And as you know, the Brazilian experience, the BNDES, the Brazilian Development Bank, uh, is really an example uh, for other developing countries. And, and now with the, the challenge of the climate crisis, uh, developing banks uh, could really uh, perform uh, a crucial role. And the previous panels, uh, the previous panels, we, we could see the role of these banks uh, as uh, a channel, not to say channel as the ours, but also the uh, development banks or uh, at the national level or regional and multilateral could increase the liquidity of uh, stated uh, contingent or, and other innovative financial instruments uh, as one uh, one of the uh, actions of BNDES was uh, exactly to buy uh, bo uh, securities, bonds, equities of, of Brazilian uh, companies to increase the, the liquidity of these this, um, securities. And then a similar role these banks could uh, perform um, related to state contingent instruments. And, and we know also the, the, the let, 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 let's say, the problematic role of credit rating agencies in constraining um, public banks uh, to increase their leverage and their development financing. Then I think that this panel uh, brings the opportunity also to uh, address many many of, of these topics and uh, emphasize the the relationship of multilateral development banks with all these these subjects. Um, uh, then I would like to introduce the panelists. Um, that is really a, a, a panel with uh, many experts, and is really a pleasure. It will be a pleasure to, to hear you. Uh, the first, my colleague, the, the Diana Barrowclough. Uh, Diana is a senior economist at UNCTAD. Uh, the, in the Division of Globalization Development uh, Strategies. Um, in addition to co-authoring the flagship uh, Trade and Development Report, she's managing research on development finance, South-South integration, structural transformation and development. Before this, uh, she lectured economics at the University of Cambridge and was elected a fellow of St. John's College. She was educated at the University of Cambridge and the University of Auckland. Uh, Diana has many uh, pub recent publications on, on development finance, development banks, and one of the, these publications, uh, Public Banks, Public Polls, and Early Actions in the Face of COVID, that she will uh, present the main results uh, of this uh, re research uh, for us, really a, a cross-cutting and research because uh, as I know as the, the, the first uh, research on the role of public banks amid the, the COVID. Uh, and then we will have the opportunity to, to hear uh, Diana. Um, after we will have Miriam Cisneros. Miriam Cisneros currently works as a real estate appraisal manager for Infonavit, a major, uh, major mortgage lending in Mexico, with seven years of experience in two development banks, uh, Sociedad Potecara Federal and Manobras. Uh, the first, a housing development bank, and the second, infrastructure development bank. Uh, make a total of 13 uh, years of experience in the, in the financial sector. She holds a PhD from Oxford University in Mathematical Finance. Then we have two Oxbridge panelists, as we call Cambridge and Oxford. Uh, Federic Pastrana is an advisor, advisor in finance to the productive sector, Minister of Productive Development of Argentina. Uh, is a technical coordinator of BC Fidel Comissos uh, and professor of money, credit, and banking at, in the Universidad Nacional de Avellaneda. Uh, 
and is also an ex-president of Bank of Inversión y Comercio Exterior of Argentina. Uh, the next panelist, Janina Leon, is a Peruvian econo economist ho that holds a PhD in development ag agriculture and environment economics from the Ohio State University. Uh, Janina has a large academic professional now experience. She has a full professor, she has been a full professor for many years and currently chair of the Department of Economics of Pontificia Universidad Católica del Peru. Previously, she has worked in the academia in Mexico, US, USA, and Spain. Her professional experience includes public administration, public sector experience. She's also consultant for international uh, organization and has uh, many areas of expertise, uh, including development finance and, and financial inclusion. Uh, our last panelist uh, is Abelardo Daza. Uh, da, uh, Abelardo is Senior Executive for Financing Solutions at CAF, Development Bank of Latin America. He was former Deputy Country Manager in Argentina and Principal Executive for the Caribbean countries. He also worked in CAF as Country Economist for Brazil and Venezuela. Uh, she, he holds a BA in Economics by University of Los Andes and a Master in Public Policy by IESA. Uh, then now let's start uh, first uh, Diana uh, that will um, summarize for, for us he, her last research on public banks. You have, have uh, all of you have 15 minutes, uh, then I let you know some minutes uh, before finish. Thank you, Diana. Thank you. Thank you, Daniela. Um, and thank you, Eklek. Uh, thank you, my colleagues in Angted, for inviting me to share this work. Um, perhaps I can just start also by saying that. Um, it's always wonderful when UNCTAD and ECLAT work together. And I think this is a really great example of that because we sitting in Geneva, we, we use your work a lot and we're always so impressed by it. And um, it's, it's very nice to, to collaborate and participate alongside you in this. I'm going to uh, share my screen and sometimes that takes a moment. So while I'm doing that, please feel free to, I've just put something in the chat and uh, please feel free to uh, quickly download that. Um, which I'm hoping is interesting for you. It's the uh, it's the publication on which I'm presenting today, uh, and it's available free at the moment from uh, the Review of Political Economy. But after a while, you will have to pay for it. So I suggest if you're interested, now is the time to take it. Um, and I will put the uh, long study on which this is based at the end of the presentation. So the material that I'm presenting today is, um, is a collaboration with Thomas Marawas from SOAS. And uh, I'm drawing upon work, which is in this uh, review of political economy that I've just put on the screen chat, sorry. And also calling on a, um, a, a huge piece of, uh, of work, the original 400 pages from which the rope article is based, um, which is available on the UNCTAD website. That's what you see in the bottom right hand corner of the screen right now. And also the trade and development reports over several years that I, I hope that, that you're familiar with and that, um, that you find these useful. So um, the topic that we're discussing today is the innovative financing mechanisms of, uh, of development banks and public financial institutions. And um, I'm sure you'll be aware that UNCTAD and ECLAC and others have been working on this theme for quite a long time. We are convinced by the evidence and also by the theory of the essential role of these public institutions and that they can be distinctive and different in the financial system. I say they can be because it's not automatic, but uh, we want to help them to be distinctive and different. And so we have uh, been looking at uh, this theme in a number of different contexts over many years. And certainly the topics that have been discussed today and yesterday, the credit rating agencies, the SDRs, these are all also intimately linked with the role of the DFIs, either, either in terms of determining what they can do in terms of their um, actions or uh, in terms of the finance that they have available. So it's all extremely relevant and interconnected. Um, so before I get into the actual presentation, I just want to say a bit of you know, the context that we're in in the global economy right now. 
where we have policymakers and governments and businesses and households all facing a cascade of crises right now. Um, it's a series of interrelated crises, and some of which stem from COVID, which is the particular lens that we're looking at right now, but others also uh, stem from the war in Ukraine right now, the threat of rising interest rates, and of course this other more long-standing uh, need to transform the way that we produce and consume and behave and act in this global economy to meet the sustainable development goals and to promote development and um, to raise incomes and living standards. And so governments are looking for the tools, sorry, that's quite noisy, isn't it? They're looking for the tools at their disposal to help them achieve these multiple and intersecting needs. And COVID gives us a very particular lens to look through this. And it's a very powerful and I think exciting lens, but you know, let's remember that actually all of these issues were here before COVID. COVID didn't just strike a, a world that was otherwise going along perfectly well, in fact, um, many had been worried for the last few decades about hyper-financialization and hyper-globalization, and in fact, the, and obviously the link, the global financialization, in which banks play a very important role. Um, so, you know, it's not as if COVID sort of struck the world that was otherwise going very well. Um, but the big lesson, I think, that we found in the last uh, two years, first, the big lesson really is that astonishing things are possible. I mean, that was really quite surprising, I think for everybody, the global economy could be abruptly put into a standstill, because it's not so much the COVID that put the economy into the standstill, it was the policies of having to trying to deal with the COVID. But we did it and um, it happened. And now we are still, you know, working our way through it. And the other big lesson is that in this experience, nobody expected that the private sector would take the driving role. And I think this is very important because we do hear always a narrative that the role of the public sector or the role of public finance is you know, to harness um, the private sector as if the private sector is this powerful engine that is going to, to drive uh, future change. But in fact, this did not happen. And I think what's really important is that no one expected it to happen. Nobody expected private finance or private banks to bail out households or to bail out struggling businesses or even to bail out governments. Um, it was governments and public banks that charted this path and there's very good reasons for it. And I think it's important that we remember that as we now face the, the next stage where you know, COVID is like a, a leading indicator of other things that may happen. So next, why are we thinking about public banks in the first place? It's worth just stopping for a moment and considering that. And one reason we published, focused on public banks is that it was, became obvious more or less from the beginning of the COVID impact on the economy that governments relied on public banks and they relied on public banks to deliver the relief and recovery and also to help finance it. So that reflects the fact that despite this kind of narrative which has been going on for the last 20 years or so, um, public banks are significant. There's a lot of them. They've got often quite well resourced. The public footprint of them is big. So it's simply not true to say that public banks are too small to make a big impact or that they're not very important as we do sometimes here. So that's why I've, I've titled this screen, it's new thinking about old institutions. So we're supposed to be talking about innovation past 15th century. So I'm not really sure that it's so innovative to say the existence of a public bank, but actually it is innovative when we think about the way that public opinion has changed over the last decades and this new resurgent push of interest in development banks and public banks today, whether for green finance or social finance, or to be catalytic in the face of the failures of the private financing. The private banks and commercial banks do many things well, but they don't do well the thing that is needed now. So estimates vary as to how many there are. We've got over 900 institutions estimated according to the Orbis website. Um, the research by my collaborator, Thomas Marawas, puts it as being $49 trillion worth of assets. Other estimates are more in the 20 trillion. So there's various assets between those numbers. Um, Régis Maradon at the Development Agency of France with, for the Finance and Common estimates that the uh, size of public bank assets is 10% of the total, total financial uh, universe. So these are big and they're significant. And especially if they are a um, have mandated in a different direction and can be different from the other institutions. 
So it's worth reminding, you know, why do we uh, think that banks are so important? And it's because they have this very special role in the economy that they can command money and they can also command time. They can buy time. They can stop time. They can speed up time. They can look long into the future. And these things are very important in the crisis. So banks were particularly important in the first months of COVID because the action of the uh, you know, social distancing or lockdown or um, indeed the sort of really stopping of the global economy led very quickly to a crisis of liquidity. And firms that had been viable before COVID-19 struck were suddenly lacking operational finance. They didn't have the reserves to which to pay their loans or their salaries. Um, exporters found themselves uh, they had not been paid for products they had already left their shores and were now sitting in, in ports somewhere. And importers had already sold products, pre-sold products that they couldn't access. Uh, local authorities and even governments faced huge and unanticipated demands on their purse. So really the unbudgeted and unplanned for expenses were extremely significant. And I think it's, it's interesting, we, the idea that we could stop the global economy so suddenly, it's really quite shocking. You know, people, I remember as a student being told that, you know, the economy is like a super tanker, it takes a very long time to change direction and takes a lot of space in the water to change direction. But actually, we stopped the global economy really very, very quickly indeed. So we could change, we could stop it. The global economy or national economies were not like a super tanker, they could be stopped. But I think there's another very interesting difference is that when you stop a super tanker, um, the tanker doesn't change its inherent nature of being a tanker. It doesn't change its shape. It doesn't change its function. It doesn't change its um, constituent parts. And yet when you stop an economy, all those things do change. So what we discovered very quickly was that actually there was a, the shock, the economic and the financial shock that came was really very profound. We saw capital flowing in and out of markets very rapidly. Uh, asset valuations fluctuating rapidly, exchange rates going crazy. And at the same time as local and federal government uh, requirements were extremely um, un unexpectedly rising, the tax revenues for which they could have paid it were falling. And importantly, even countries that had no COVID still felt these effects, or countries that did not put in place any policies to redress um, you know, to, to close the economy or for lockdown, they also ex um, experienced exactly the same shocks. So Sweden, which was um, which did not put in place the same lockdown, still experienced the fall in GDP and the same financial ricochets. Fiji, an island in the Pacific, which had no COVID, still had all the same shocks that everybody else did because it's part of global supply chains and, and tourism stopped. And so the fact that they didn't have COVID made no difference. Everybody was impacted. So it's worth thinking about why banks were so important in this uh, period of time. And the thing is that banks are extremely unusual and specific institutions that have been given a political right to perform the very powerful function of creating credit and guiding it. And um, for this reason, they're one of the most important institutions in our capitalist society. So when I look at the next screen, we see how did this health crisis manifest into a financial and economic crisis? In all the countries of the world, the government actions to try and redress the shock was played through banks. So whether it's fiscal policies you see in the blue or loans and loan guarantees in the green or quantitative easing policies in the orange, these policies, which were the most important policies put in place in almost all countries, to various degrees, obviously, but they played through banks. The extent to which they can deliver depends obviously on the resources of different countries. And I think what we see very clearly that countries on the left-hand side of this graph were able to put in place huge, um, huge responses and indeed very quickly, whereas the countries on the right had much less capacity to respond. Um, but it's not to say that they did nothing. And uh, I'm going to talk a bit uh, now about what some of the banks we study did. Um, I won't say too much about Latin America because we've got a lot of experts following me who will, who will know a lot about the Latin American experience. But I think what is important for us to note is that the Global South actually uh, did quite a lot. And this was really important because even though the Bretton Woods institutions did beef up their response, it was very small by comparison to what they did for the global financial crisis. So 
the role of banks was really much more important from the national and the regional level. So what banks did and how did they do it? So what the findings I want to share with you is from research that we started in May of 2020 and we ran from May until October. It was a very fluid time. There was no particular theory guiding sort of how we might do the study. All we knew is that banks were very important and we had pre-existing um, collaborations and networks of people working on banks that we could call on. So we started a study with 24 different researchers all around the world, everybody covering particular banks or sometimes thematic study on several banks. Um, also, we engaged the support of regional public bank associations and development finance institutions. And on the basis of these four regional associations, we covered about another 300 banks. And we're following up this work now in 2022, both through work with the Finance and Common Initiative and by expanding the original team on, on this work. So we approach things from a very explorative, really bottom-up case study approach. We interviewed the senior officers of, of all the banks we were studying. And for the most part, we were doing it, you know, working from our homes. Some people were working on their kitchen tables, some people had nice, uh, you know, studies, but everybody was essentially at home, including the banks that we were interviewing. And um, it was a very difficult task because programs which were announced one day were superseded the next day by something even bigger. Or in other cases, a big program announced but never actually implemented. So it was quite a difficult um, uh, game to chase. Um, but it was exciting. And I think that we did, you know, I'm very, really very proud of the work that the whole team did working under such difficult circumstances. And I think this fair to say that this was the first and the most wide ranging study of public banks responses. Um, I know that ECLAC also did a study a bit later. And in fact, we did call on that study. We cited it. It's a wonderful piece of work. And, uh, and I hope ECLAC is, is continuing that too. Although the ECLAC approach was a bit different. It was more of an overview, whereas we were going into individual banks. So I think together, you know, there's a lot of um, exploratory power in these studies. So thinking about the lessons that we learned in particular, um, there were five that really come out. And the first was that you know, rapid response is possible. When you look at public banks, because they are public institutions and often quite closely related with other public authorities, um, they, can, they can move very, very fast because they're in the public sphere and they can work with public authorities and uh, they can react quickly as a matter of policy. So it doesn't have to be a business decision, it can be a policy decision. Um, in most cases, initiatives started within weeks. You know, which is pretty fast if you certainly the commercial commercial lending can often take much much longer the second point is that the mandates are absolutely essential so in cases where the public mandate was clear where it was unambiguous and where it was a, a public purpose mandate they could move very very quickly in other cases where things were a bit less certain, where public banks had to also follow more com commercial imperative, for example, it was ambiguous and they rolled out programs slowly or sometimes um, even not at all in environments that were hostile to them. So there were cases in countries that in the past had had very uh, strong public banking systems, but these had been um, undermined over years and they in fact were not really able to respond. The third point is the need for boldness and generosity. And this was a message that, um, in fact, Langtad had in its, uh, in its TDR on the Global Green New Deal in 2018. We found that boldness and generosity was essential in a crisis. And what we observed with these banks, too, is that the ones that were in the best uh, situation to respond were very bold, increasing dissemination or disbursement of loans by more than 100% for example. So these are big, big pushes. And they were innovative because these were, in some cases, they had to uh, develop digital banking systems for the first time. Staff had to learn how to do digital banking and customers had to learn how to do it. So they had to be innovative in terms of the way they provided the product, but they also had to be innovative in terms of the kinds of products that they provided. Um, some I banks were not... Uh, uh, the time is over, but you could only um, ah, okay or <laughs> oh my gosh it goes fast doesn't it all right well i'll just okay. go very quickly so i'll put this so that people can read it in fact i've spoken to this already the instruments that banks used 
uh, varied according to different banks, but guarantees and loans were the most important. Um, equity lending obviously was something or equity position takes too long to organize. So loans, equities, and holidays were the, some of the most important um, instruments used. And I've talked already to this question about the promising public purpose versus having a challenging purpose. And I think, you know, Brazil, for example, is a case, you talked about BNDS before Daniela. So in B the case of BNDS, in previous crises, they had really had extremely strong countercyclical response. And you don't observe that this time around. And the same is the case, for example, for India or Turkey, the banks which had a less clear mandate were not so countercyclical. Um, or sometimes borrowers were indifferent to whether they borrowed from a private bank or a public bank, which is not to say the governments didn't roll out supportive programs, but that the role of the bank was different. Um, so I'll just by finish with very quick mentioning of these new centers of gravity. This is the Southern led banks, and they were able to respond extremely quickly. And I think this is uh, um, an example of a Southern solidarity really, that we saw fast response and very good relations with other national banks or regional banks. So I just want to finish really by making this connection with the speakers who have come before that, you know, we're facing right now um, huge demands on public banking more than ever before. Um, interest rates are rising and some people have argued that this means that the role of the public banks will be more difficult. But actually, I think we can say, you know, if, if not public banks in this environment of rising interest rates, then who? And we have short memories if we think that interest rates have always been below 5%. You know, public banks have been very important when interest rates were um, multiple factors higher than this. So scaling up is going to be essential for them to play this role. And here we have the link with the SDRs. And many of the banks in our survey were actively trying to access SDR links through their regional banks. Um, and then there's a the question of mandate tension. And that I think this comes into the question before about you know, whether it was uh, credit rating agencies that um, constrain banks as previous speakers you know, have discussed this, this sort of tightrope that goes with the credit rating agencies and the banks. So the credit rating agencies do constrain these banks often their governments insist they should get AAA rating. But at the same time, the credit rating agencies themselves say, if banks were perceived as being strongly supported by their government owners, they could scale up lending greatly without it impacting on the credit rating. So there's a kind of ironic shoot yourself in the foot game going on here. I'm going to finish just with one last comment, which is that for public banks to be useful, they must not be hijacked by this vision of bending their purpose just to uh, de -risk, so called de risk investment and to support private markets. That's not going to uh, produce the kind of result that we want. So, thank you very much, Daniela, and um, thank you, everybody. Thank you, Diana. You know, very interesting, both the, um, the results of your uh, research and also this last uh, slide is on the challenges and how in regional multilateral developing banks could uh, perform a crucial role in climate change finance, the SDGs. And um, sorry for <laughs> cutting No, you. no, I'm sorry I went over. Uh, I couldn't then, see my clock because of the screen. Uh, no, okay, then now um, we have Miriam, Miriam Cisneros, uh, that will uh, focus her intervention on the lessons learned from uh, uh, the experience in the introduction of fin innovative financial mechanism by development banks in Mexico. Then we be really interesting for here for about the Mexico, Mexico experience. Thank you. Thank you very much, Daniela. Uh, first of all, uh, thank you to, to TACT and ECLAC for, for inviting me. Uh, really, these workshops is very interesting and has been very useful so far. So um, thank you very much. Um, I'll, my intervention is going to be more from a practical point of view. Uh, my experience in, in Development Bank and now uh, in the institution I, I work for. Um, I don't have a presentation. 
uh, but to start, let me give you a synthesis on the development banking sector in Mexico. After that, I'll comment a bit on financing during the COVID uh, pandemic and financing in general in the development bank sector in Mexico to finalize with some uh, own ideas uh, for the future in terms of innovative financing mechanism um, and so on. Um, well, uh, development banking uh, plays uh, an important role in supporting uh, with financing and various services uh, to, to some different sectors and projects uh, in Mexico with high social profitability, we say. In particular, the traditional role of the development banking is to fund projects whose social profitability justifies them, but uh, whose private profitability is not high enough or immediate to make them attractive to commercial inter intermediaries. Development banks have three main channels for injecting resources into the economy. The, one, uh, the first one is direct loans, which is called the first floor banking. The second one is loans to the financial intermediaries, uh, intermediaries uh, who in turn um, grant them to enterprises, so general public. This is the, the acting as a second floor bank. Uh, but also uh, they um, grant warranties through, through which development banks induce intermediaries to grant loans. That's uh, a, a more promoting uh, activity of the, of the banks. Um, most of them are uh, mainly second floor banks. Um, they operate through a broad variety of financial entities, uh, really broad, uh, like uh, big commercial banks, AAA banks, but also small entities like niche entities, saving banks, what we call in Mexico so forms, which is a multi-purpose financial society, and another figure, figure that is called SOFOL, which is a limited purpose financial society among others. The, 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 this, this is because the, 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 bank, the financial sector in Mexico is, is very broad. Uh, the development banking sector in Mexico is uh, made up of six banks. Uh, Banco Mex, which is for exports. Banobras, which is for infrastructure and services to subnational entities, mainly states and municipalities. Uh, Sociedad Hipotecaria Federal, or CIF, for housing. Nothing is for support small to medium sized enterprises mainly, but it has a broader um, context. Banjercito that serves Mexico's armed forces. Uh, Banco del Bienestar is for the savings and financial inclusion of the most vulnerable sector of the population. And there are also two other promoting development institutions, um, which is one, FIRA, it's, uh, his goal is to promote agricultural, livestock, fishing, forestry, handicrafts, ecotourism, ag agribusiness, and related uh, trade activities on that. And the second one is FND. Is, um, his goal is uh, for agricultural, rural, forestry, and fishery development. This is the, the bank, uh, development banking sector in Mexico. As of September 2020, financing by this institution measure as total credit among granted, representing a share of 30% more or less of the fin financing provided by the banking system and represents 11, uh, almost 12% of the GDP. Why, this is why uh, the sector is very important. Uh, and measured by the credit balance as the end of December 2021, Banobras accounted for 49% of, of, of the participation, NAFIN 18%, Banco Mex 23%, Sociedad Hipotecaria Federal 6%, Banjarcito 5%, and Bienestar less than 1%. So we see that uh, Banobras is the, the big um, development bank in Mexico. Mm, in, uh, in relevant episodes of, of economic contraction, we, we have several of them. Uh, we had in 1995, we have uh, one global to, to, to 2008, to, to 2009, and, and September 2019, and recently the COVID pandemic. Uh, the commercial banks financing was generally inverse to that of the banking. That is, uh, when the growth rate of financing uh, provided by commercial banks is reduced that of the development banks arises 
this is uh, the development banking assumes a contracyclical role as uh, just as Diana mentioned in, in her presentation. Um, the same inverse relationships occurs between the rate of change of development bank financing and that of the GDP during the, the aforementioned periods. That's, that's why the, 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 the development banks are very important in countries like Mexico. To give you, to give you a, a flavor of the situation for the development bank during the COVID uh, pandemic, the change in total balance between uh, 2019 and 2020 was 6%, but comparing to 2020 versus 2021, was minus five, uh, 4%. This is um, how uh, uh, the, the, the um, development banks are somehow uh, collecting the, 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 the downfalls of the economy. These figures also reflect the anticipative and reactive efforts by the authority and the regulators towards the pandemic. Uh, the development banks uh, acted uh, uh, in side by side by the authority. For example, in March 2020, the authority launched a series of measures called special accounting criteria aimed at preventing financial and liquidity stress among the credit institutions for the no payment of the accredited counterparties. It's mainly caused by the confinement. It was longer than we expected and the economic activity slowed down. The objective was to, to grant accounting benefits when performing two main measures. One was interest or, or principal payment deferral up to six months, and some of them uh, longer, and extensions of term up to six months, but uh, act, uh, um, op 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 operated very quickly. In September 2020, when it started to be clearer that the pandemic will be longer than expected, the authority launched a new series of measures I'm at credit restructuring when lending institutions could choose to grant rebates, write-offs, bonuses, or discounts. Um, this was the, the two main measures re regarding the pandemic. Uh, thus, in response to the, this coronavirus pandemic, Mexican Development Bank provided financial resources in circa of uh, 13 billion of US dollars, representing 1% of GDP between uh, between 2020 and beginning of 2021. Um, for example, in Sociedad Hipotecaria Federal, that we, we implemented uh, very quickly in less than one and a half week, uh, these measures uh, and also making, uh, relating to the, to, the, to the first point Diana said, the, the rapid response uh, possible, we, we were very, very quickly we implemented the deferrals uh, uh, through all our clients, but was surprising uh, uh, that only 30% of the clients uh, asked for the deferral, no more than that. And although the repayment time was set to, to the end of the credit most of the time or in the construction loans linked to the sale of the houses, by mid 2021, two tiers of the clients have already uh, paid the deferrals that uh, uh, meant to us a, a very uh, a, a, a sector very uh, uh, receptive of the measures and, and, and also that they, they, they turn around the, the, the downfalls of the pandemic very quickly. Uh, we need to consider that the COVID pandemic also accelerated digital operation. The, uh, referring to the second point um, and third of, the, of Diana's, the, in terms of public purpose um, and boldness, uh, we were very bold in uh, operate all the time uh, outside the offices and, and implemented very quickly digital operation. Um, and also, uh, in my point of view, this series of measures and new, uh, and new more efficient digital operation can be considered in some sense an innovative financial mechanism that, that can provide us with new ideas for the future. In general, all this pandemic, we can uh, we have uh, lesser, lessons learned. In regard of common and new financing mechanism, uh, let me tell you that traditionally, the development banks, uh, uh, for, for development banks gr granting credit, they use their own capital, debt insurance, 
and loan from uh, multilateral institutions uh, as, as any other uh, development bank. Since uh, uh, 2016, some development banks in Mexico have issued green bonds to fin finance environmental and sustainable development projects. Let me tell you some examples that are very interesting. For example, the NAFIN in September uh, 2016 issued a green bond becoming the first issuer of its kind in Mexican pesos, certified under the standard of Climate Bond Initiative. So far I know the resources would be used exclusively to finance to develop and development and construction of a wind farm, its transmission infrastructure and two mini hydro plants. Um, also very interesting, Banobras in 2016 uh, was the first development bank in Latin America to issue the first sustainable bond to finance uh, and refinance environmental and social development projects. Since then, it has issued almost every year of, of these um, develop, development bonds with a total accumulate, cumulative of uh, almost 3 billion of US dollars, which is um, uh, for financing most of their, the projects. Also, Afonadin, which is a, a public federal vehicle for investment in, in infrastructure instituted in Banabras. Uh, as an example of, of, of financing mechanism, uh, used to securitize future flows of road section through the transfer of the collection of rights. Uh, uh, and I know some other similar instruments uh, have, have been used in the past. Uh, in regard to Sociedad Hipotecaria Federal in the housing sector, in July 2020, the Climate Bond Initiative certified the Eco Casa program of, of CIF as a standard on the modality of low carbon residential building in Mexico. This recognition uh, will allow possible issues of, of green bonds with support from housing projects evaluated, certified, and financed by CIF under the criteria of the Eco Casa and Edge programs, encouraging, encouraging additional emission from other participants and gradually increasing the constructions of low carbon houses. Uh, for example, in December 2021, CIF granted a guarantee to a corporate green bond issue for sustainable building under the COCASA Edge program, certified by the Climate Bond Initiative. It was a guarantee at 15% of the issuance, pari passu with the IBD. Um, it's worth mentioning that ECOCASA is the leading sustainable social housing program in Mexico that allows the reduction of CO2 emissions by more than 20% compared to a baseline hose, and also contributes to the sustainable development goal and environmental commitments to the country. The program has been in operation since uh, 2013, created by CIF together with the German Development Bank, the, the KFW and the IBD. It has benefited more than 75,000 families and achieve a cumulative reduction in greenhouse gases emission of 1.9 million tons of CO2 equivalent. Now, uh, in regard uh, uh, from the, the side of financial products offered for, by the development banks, uh, banks offer lines of credit where the primary source of, of payment is the counterparty's balance sheet in general, but collateralized by the assets being financed, for example, in C for construction credits. The natural guarantee is the land and the construction that is being built. Being collateralized allow greater leverage than without any additional guarantees that uh, allows the, the development banks to, to, to broader uh, audience. Uh, depending on the sector, these type of credit lines are useful. They are ideal to support construction projects, for example, they're, they're uh, very specific products. Another means of encouraging credit is the provision of credit guarantees, such as direct guarantees, letter of credit, and home credit insurance. This last, uh, uh, for example, is granted by the subsidiary of, of six, uh, Sociedad Hipotecaria Federal for, for mortgages. The amount of credit guarantees granted by the, the whole development bank system in Mexico was 7.8 billion of US dollars as of December, 2021 which is a very good amount. Uh, to finish my intervention, uh, I'll, and also contributing to the discussion on what new financing instruments could be explored, 
just an ideas. Uh, let me confess that I, I don't have all the knowledge or the context in terms of the market, legal, or operational possibility or difficulties in Mexico of, of, of this proposal, but I think uh, um, it has been useful in other countries and, and it can be useful in countries like us in Latin America. A first idea is uh, to use collateralized loan obligations uh, from the point of view that, uh, for example, in Mexico, development banks will already grant collateralized credit loans. And, and a second idea is maybe the contingent bond uh, linked to credit guarantees climate events. As development banks, uh, we provide credit guarantees where claims are very clearly defined and, 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 uh, and observed for, for a long time. Um, and also, I, 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 I like to mention um, from, from uh, financing housing or greenhouses, uh, for example, uh, uh, another very interesting idea is uh, how the institute where I currently work does. It, it, it makes up, uh, it has been operating for 50 years and very good, uh, actually. It's a fund that con combines flows from workers, employers, and government with contribution every month linked to the salary of the workers. And after a while of that contribution, the worker can access a mortgage. This is a, a fund that has been, as I said, uh, uh, working for 50 years and still is the, the major uh, uh, um, um, giver of mortgages in the country. Well, that, with that, I finish my, my presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you, exactly 50 minutes. Um, many thanks for this uh, summary, but we've re reached the tales on the Mexican experience and uh, from, uh, from what you uh, told us, I think that the Mexico experience uh, offers really good examples that could be emulated for uh, by others, um, development banks in Latin America and even other other uh, regions. Uh, then, Miriam, thank you very much. And uh, now um, uh, I uh, give the floor to Federico Pastrana. Uh, that will like my <laughs> Federico uh, will focus on the lessons learned from the rec recent experience with the system of guarantees in Argentina. You have 15 minutes. Okay, thank you, Diana. Thank you, Daniela and Miriam. Um, I will share. Can you see the presentation? Yes. Yes, okay. perfect. Perfect. Yes, only uh, you could put in the um, visualization, change visualization mode yeah. to, to increase is, is in the, uh, below here where it's like. Yeah, a no, uh, I know. Yeah, oh, okay, great. Okay. Really. Thank right. you. Well, good morning to, to the participants that are connected. I want to thank uh, ICLAC and Anuntad for the invitation to this workshop. Uh, and it's a pleasure to me to uh, discuss with you the characteristics and particularities that had the policies to the productive sector in Argentina in the last three years uh, during the pandemic. The focus of my presentation is the Argentine experience in the pandemic and post-pandemic, mainly the innovations in the guarantee system that allowed to expand the credit so an important portion of micro, small, and medium enterprises in our country. The topics of the presentations of my presentation are three. The first one is the Argentine model of guarantee funds. The second one is the credit policies during the pandemic. And finally, I will talk about the challenges and innovative policies in the post-pandemic. Let's start talking about the first topic. It's important to know that Argentine, uh, Argentina uh, have three types of institutions that issue guarantees, not only one, have three, three types of institutions. The private funds, the public regional or provincial funds, 
and the public national fund. The private that is encouraged by an income tax reduction law. Yes, the private. The, the public, uh, the provincial funds that contribute, uh, that have cost contributions of the states with a small size and the public national with a rapid growth in the pandemic. We call this set of institutions as the guarantee system of Argentina. This system began in the middle of the 90s, developed in the 2000s and had an exponential growth in the pandemic. Let's talk about the, the credit policies in Argentina during the pandemic. The public credit policy had a central role during the pandemic in Argentina. It was very important in protecting formal employment and particularly MSIMEs. Most of the credit policy was directed by the, uh, from the central government and was carried out through the banks compulsively. Yes, mandatory. All of the loans that banks were uh, obliged to give to MSIMEs were regulated by the central bank and has and had a 7% guarantee of the Argentine Guarantee Fund, the national fund called FOGAR. This was one of the particularities of this Argentine experience during the pandemic. Two policies during the pandemic was uh, works as uh, work as an example. First, the, we find the loans to independent workers. For the first time in Argentine in Argentine history, credits were given through credit cards with a balance available only for the consumption of goods and services. For those who uh, who did not have a, uh, have a credit card, banks were obliged to issue a card free of charge. In the first edition. 560,000 credits were given and 40 did not have a credit cards previously. This was a very important policy during the pandemic in Argentina. Maybe the, the most important. Second one, uh, we find the PIME Plus program. Banks were obliged to offer loans to MSMEs without a credit history. This allowed uh, to incorporate uh, 6,000 MSMEs that previously were excluded to the financial sector. More, most of them uh, were the, uh, have a, uh, had the 7% guarantee of the FOGAR. Well, the rapid, uh, the rapid expansion of guarantees in the financial system during the pandemic led to a significant capit capitalization of FOGAR, the national fund, that grew 70 times in one year, 70 times. This led to a significant change in Argentine guarantee system. At the same time, at, at the, same time the progress of FOGAR on excluded people registering low delinquency shows the multiplying effects of guarantees. Also highlights the loss opportunity of banks and the mechanism that can be used to increase the debt of a nation system and to enhance the financial inclusion without putting sustainability of the system at risk. In this table, we can see the importance of FOGAR at the present. Nowadays, the FOGAR represents the 75 of the capital available to issue guarantee in the system with 100, $100 million. And with more than 1 million of guarantee issues, issued to MSMEs and independent workers during the last three years. Now we'll finish the presentation talking about the post-pandemic challenges and the innovations. The first challenge, I think that is the importance of deepen financial inclusion. With the good results of the first round of credit to independent workers with low delinquency, the government decided to implement a second round last year. Secondly, in Argentine experience, it's necessary to leave compulsory instruments and go to voluntary instruments based in, on incentives. The, in third place, it's important to organize the actors of guarantee system based in a new context. And finally, it's imperative to insert the FOGAR in the financial sector based in a long-term relationship with the banking system and taking advantage of the significant capitalization. 
I want to share the experience that the, <coughs> we, had, we had last year in a study about international policies on guarantees in a collabor collaborative uh, work between the Ministry of Productive Development and ICLAD uh, with the collaboration of Guillermo Sorieta, Martina Vélez, Joe Ferraz, Guillermo, uh, Guillermo Pérez, Calante, and they team. We prepare a survey of international best practices about credit guarantees. The main topics were institutional framework and governance with, uh, we, we find a diversity of experience, the organization and management uh, with the important, importance of risk management and the relation with the financial institutions and uh, the, the topic, the, the more important topic for, uh, was uh, the choice of an instrument. And the most important, the main choice was uh, between the, the a, guarant, uh, a system of guarantees uh, by program or individual guarantees or by portfolio. Well, we present two recent cases of innovation in the credit policy to the private sector in Argentina. One institutional, the Council of Guarantees, and one instrumental, the FOGAR with first loss. FOGAR is the National Public uh, Fund of, uh, for Guarantees. About the first one, the National Guarantee Council is created with the objective of proposing a long-term agenda and carry out actions that allow the coordination between the different actors of the system. Coordination is the greatest element of the Council. Remember that Argentina have three types of uh, funds and coordination is uh, it's, uh, the best uh, challenge. Now, uh, the objectives of the National Guarantee Council are propose an implementation of actions that contribute to a better art, uh, articulation between the actors, make proposals for re new regulation, propose annual plans, avoid overlaps and guide the system towards a greater financial inclusion, advise on improving policy, uh, public policies and propose and specific programs, programs that uh, promote the development of credit access. The actors that participate in the National Council of Guarantees are institutions that issue guarantees, the financial and non-financial institutions, the beneficiaries, MSIMEs and independent workers, and the regulatory uh, institutions like Central Bank, National Security Commission, and the Ministry of uh, Public Development. We started the council meetings in October 2020, uh, last year, and we think that there are many changes in the future. Uh, the discussion about financial inclusion needs the collaboration of different actors, not only the institutions of the public sector. We think that the council is an element that collaborates in, uh, with these objectives. Well, uh, the second innovation is instrumental. We design a new scheme to the Public Guarantee Fund, the FOGAR, discussion with the actors of Argentine financial system and take it the best practices of the paper done with CEPAL e -CLAC. We conclude that the FOGAR should have a portfolio scheme in which the bank select the company and carry out the risk analysis. We guarantee, uh, the guarantee is issued in 24 hours and we propose a percent of furloughs of fur loss that gives sustainability to the fund. The credit criteria are in line with the FOGAR's objectives that are for, first of all, the strengthen, strengthen the, the financial inclusion of those who are excluded uh, from the system, lower financial costs to MSIMEs, increase credit, uh, credit risk, uh, risk taking in certain segments, that are usually rejected uh, through traditional uh, risk analysis and for the reduction uh, of uh, inequalities, given that the, the financial system reproduces uh, usually the, the inequalities of the system. The main uh, features of this scheme, uh, the FOGAR for loss are the automaticity, the guarantees are given automatically uh, with the fulfillment of the conditions, the risk shading, all loans uh, can guarantee uh, of, of loans can guarantee uh, by FOGAR up to the 75% of the capital. Therefore, the risk is shared with the uh, financial institution until the end of the loan. The first loss 
uh, uh, that uh, the total portfolio has a, a first loss scheme aligned with respect to the liquidity of the portfolio, which provides a predictable uh, productivity and sustainability. Uh, our first experience of our loss uh, level is 10%. And the, the first, uh, the fourth uh, characteristic is the monitoring and renewable. The Fogarra agrees for one year with a six monthly re uh, review. This allows the portfolio to be tracked and analyzed in terms of additionality. What are the characteristics of the credits? Uh, well, the credit uh, benefits are MSIMEs and, and individuals, uh, independent workers, the designation are investment or working capital. About the term, the credit must have at least one year term. And about the fee, is, it is decreasing with respect to the term of the credit. Uh, at present, uh, it is working with 21 banks for a total of uh, 40, uh, $400 million, which is expected to double uh, in the coming months. Well, summarizing the public um, credit policy had a central role during the pandemic in Argentina, especially by the expansion of the guarantee system. In terms of innovation, the creation of a new scheme for the public national fund, the Fogar for Lost, proposed a flexible scheme in which banks can work accordingly to their specificity, always oriented towards a greater financial inclusion. Likewise, the portfolio scheme permits an effect efficient management of the guarantees with a low uh, operational structure, with the policy and uh, with the possibility of rapid growth without putting the sustainability of the fund at risk. We found that the, uh, with the National Council of Guarantees, the program for loss is the most innovative policy that the national government is developing in terms of the financial inclusion, an important topic in the development bank's action. Well, I hope that the presentation was productive to you and I thank you for, the, for your attention. Many thanks, exactly 15 minutes. Uh, during your presentation, I was also thinking that both the, uh, the Argentina and the American experience shows that the development banks don't have only a counter-cyclical role. That is, I remember after the global financial crisis, the World Bank recognized, sorry, uh, this counter-cyclical role, but the structural role. And one of these structural holes are the financial inclusion. Uh, then, then this is really interesting. And sure, the other are development uh, finance that the profit-seeking private banks uh, couldn't provide. But really very interesting, many things. Um, then now we, um, we have Janina Leon. Uh, that we discuss uh, the developed bank experience with innovative financial instruments in Peru. Uh, then, Janina, you also have uh, 50 minutes. Not to see. Thank you so much. Ah, okay, uh, thank you. Yeah, I know. Thank you so much. Good morning. Um, I want to. Also, thanks the, for the invitation to this important conference. Uh, thanks to ECLAT, to Esteban, to Fausto, and uh, thank you for, because it's a very interesting space to discuss this topic, which is important not only in the context of COVID, but even before. Uh, so I will take advantage of hearing my previous colleagues uh, referring the experiences of Mexico, Argentina, and overall to maybe replicate uh, some of the inferences. Let me share, please, my PPT, which is very, hopefully, not too long. Um, okay. So what I am trying to, to present now is, uh, in general terms, how was our experience in Peru? Uh, from the development bank uh, perspective and uh, what we did during the, the COVID, but I will highlight just one program, which I think is very like to the Argentinian experience. Well, here I'm just trying to uh, remember that 
economic growth, economic development, especially in our countries, is totally linked to the financial development. And we cannot forget the linkage uh, because they are uh, there are lots of uh, feedback, relations, connections. That's why we are interested in the financial institutions and financial development at all. And the instruments are very important. So I mentioned this because I think they, uh, this is the, the conditions, these are the conditions for making a public policy or multilateral agencies or international institutions more or less successful when they are uh, bringing some financial resources. Um, in general, in countries like Peru, financial markets are small, capital markets and stock markets are even smaller. The financial intermediaries are not only regulated institutions as first floor banks and other development banks, but also we have important non-regulated or semi-regulated institutions like NGOs, and there are lots of informal financial channels, and we don't know how how much they are moving in terms of uh, financial uh, fundings because uh, they are informal, right? And also we have a, a, an heterogeneous array of deposits and loans, even in the regulated institutions. And in the case of Peru, the regulator uh, is under a prudential model of regulation. And still they have some problems. Um, and besides, maybe you heard about Peru, we have had social and political business environment problems uh, very frequently in the last uh, five years. Especially. So the stock market uh, in general, even before the, the COVID has been small, not only the stock market named the Bolsa de Valores, but there are other Bolsa de Valores in Peru as well. They are very tiny. And also we are incorporated to the Mercado Integrado de Latin America, MILA. So they have increased until nine, uh, 2019, and they were increasing their activities. We had international and foreign agencies, which were providing international experience and higher uh, human capital for professionals in these areas. Uh, beside that, we have in the, uh, among the regulated intermediaries around 50 banks. Two of them are concentrated, sorry, more than 50%. That's what I went here. Two have more than 50% of the market. And we, we have also municipal banks and finance, and we have uh, some kind of cooperatives, different, likely different than the credit unions of Mexico. Um, also, we have state-owned banks like Banco de la Nación and Agrobanco, and development bank like COFIDE, which is the Development Financial Corporation. In Spanish, means COFIDE. We also have some non-regulated institutions, uh, not only NGOs, but also some cooperatives, especially uh, operating in rural areas or small areas. And there are relatives, traders, uh, rotating savings and credit associations uh, in the informal finance. And also recently, we have other more, I would say, criminal schemes. One is named, for example, Gota a Gota, uh, when people come to uh, the informal lenders come to recover their money. And if you are not there, you have to pay gota a gota, drop by drop. Otherwise, you will have to face serious uh, problems in your safety yeah, or your family. So <clears throat> before the COVID, we have a strong fiscal and monetary policy. There was a strategy of public uh, resource administration. The central bank was very hard in keeping this uh, exchange rate in a range of acceptable rate related to the development uh, growth of the GDP. And um, we have low uh, inflation and we have uh, growth. Although I must say that starting 2016 or 17, 
this growth rate was decreasing, but still it was positive persistently along more than 10 years. Um, in terms of financial services, we have diverse deposits and loans. A loan portfolio are mostly for large businesses, which is not strange because large businesses are demanding long or larger deposits and larger loans as well. Um, but even in Lima and urban areas, we have problems for financial inclusion because there are lots of uh, micro enterprises, um, people in general with limited access to financial services. Also, we have an issue with the uh, private pension funds. Uh, it's continuously in debate, like in the case of Chile. And there were some legal changes uh, in these uh, tensions between the presidency or the executive and the Congress. And there were increasing withdrawals of these funds which were generating problems in the financial system as well. Um, the superintendency of bank and insurance in Peru is prudential, uh, has prudential regulation, but still they had to deal with all these problems. And I want to highlight the social and political business environment we have in Peru. Just before the COVID, we had five presidents in less than five years. And um, also the Congress was closed. And also as Mexico and Argentina face, we have increasing international migration. All these elements are, uh, were, were yes present before the COVID and were making things complicated in the economy and then the financial development. During the COVID uh, around March, the policies were very strict. Uh, lockdown, curfew, and shutdown of the economy. The number of workers uh, was reduced, and we have a, a, a fall of private asset issues and a slow financial markets activity. Still, some businesses grew, you know, some financial activities, uh, also some in the commerce, pharmacies, for example, banks as well, foreign investment in mining in mining and other sectors were, were facing problems, but still growing, different to the rest of the economy. The political turmoil was persistent and there was, we had another presidential vacancy and some reforms still uh, reducing the pension funds with uh, more and more withdrawals uh, legally authorized. In the last two years, these things have changed in some way. We have uh, the government issuing some public funds which were sold in the US markets. And they were very well accepted according to the authorities by then. And still some private loans uh, grew, especially for um, large firms if in solis or in the Peruvian uh, currency. Still, small firms and consumer loans got uh, most of their loans in uh, dollars in the US currency. It's important because if we have exchange rate problems, then the uh, loans are increasing as well since the sales are made in, in solids, right? So the slow recovery of the economy and financial activities is a still a problem. The health uh, policies are still very restricted and the uh, model is still persistent. My time. Oh. Well, what are, have been main policies? Oh, it's okay. It's okay. Okay, okay. sorry. Four minutes. Uh, what are being, uh, there have been several policies in the areas of financial uh, issues uh, because things were getting worse. One program was Reactiva, loans for firms uh, managed by Cofide. Agrobanco, which was a bank for agricultural issues, closed first and now is open just to manage one lending fund. We have also Banco de la Nación, which is an, a state bank just for channeling the, the cash transfers and the payment of salaries for the 
state workers. There were some reinforcement of the national strategy for financial inclusion and other minor programs for small groups of population. I just wanted to highlight this reactiva uh, as a key scheme uh, of guarantee for working capital loans, short-term loans for firms. Uh, between 2020 and today, uh, the government has channeled around 15,000 millions of dollars, which is around 10% of the GDP. Um, and the scheme is the government puts the money and it is administrated by COFIDE. COFIDE select the firms and the money is uh, kept by the central bank. So there are several uh, institutions involved in uh, providing these resources. And it's important because uh, central bank is always concerned about the effects that this money injection can generate in terms of inflation like it's happening today. Uh, it was, this scheme was uh, thought just for one year, but it's still persistent because the firms are not too happy with the recovery. They are not recovery, economic recovery at all. And then they don't have enough resources to repay. So um, this reactiva has been very important for large firms. And there are other similar programs which were created just uh, after for small firms, for tourist uh, small firms for agriculture. All of them were managed by COFIDE. And also the government has opened this Fondo Agro um, by uh, a connection between Agrobanco and, the, and, the ministry, and the Ministry of Agriculture. And for the experienced people, it is more political managed. So uh, this uh, Reactiva scheme was very interesting because uh, was an um, policy, a finance policy, uh, engaging public institutions, development banks, and they seem to have uh, had important, uh, provide important support to these uh, firms, not only small, but also large firms. The problem now is that if it is postponed and the payments are postponed, the problem is uh, that possible uh, pressure of inflation, according to some experts. So in summary, we have some original things because our financial development was poor. Our markets are small, not too many institutions and many regulated institutions. And other problems like geographic concentration of the economy and financial development is just in Lima and urban areas, um, making them financial markets small and high transaction costs for the rest of the population. We, have, we face large problems of financial exclusion and this persistent political and social stress is still from many years ago and is worse uh, even today. COVID complicated a scenario with a slow economic recovery and the development banks I think have played an important role like uh, uh, excuse me, Diana uh, highlighted, uh, referring the experience of other countries. We also have an important role for the development banks, especially COFIDE, which wide the view products uh, uh, following the policy of the government. But I think COFIDE has to have more initiative. They must look for gathering more resources and wide their constituencies. And on the Banco de la Nación, I think uh, beside all the things that they were doing, they can uh, expand their uh, functions in the frame of the law of banks, but they can work with commercial banks. Other policies important, I think, in this new scenario is to stress digitalization, internet use, technology innovation, which I have demonstrated they have been very important today. Thank you so much. Many thanks, Janina. Um, two issues only that, um, that came to my mind. The, this uh, 
digitalization, all, all these new technologies, I think this is an important issue that developing banks, public banks will also need to, to adopt. And also this relationship of, uh, with commercial banks, because um, uh, media mentioned uh, in the case of Mexico, and if you have time, you could also uh, let us know, because in the case of Brazil, BNDES, uh, the NDS has direct operations loans, but also uh, on lending uh, to commercial banks. There are two kinds of loans, one more working capital, uh, that this is uh, on lending, and your other, uh, the other, the direct loans are more long term for infrastructure, etc. So I think these two uh, channels, they, they are important, have different roles. And uh, I think that what we are hearing here is that the, the, the country's uh, experience uh, differ also regarding that. So thank you very much. Thank and you. Now, uh, now our last panelist, Abelardo Daza, uh, that will focus on the lessons uh, learned from uh, his experience in the CAFI, uh, which is a reg regional developed bank, um, complementing thus the experience of national development banks. Uh, the floor is yours, Abelardo, uh, also 50 minutes. I don't know if he is connected. Uh, I'm not seeing a bit of a bit of though. I'm here, I'm here. Sorry, ah, Daniela. Okay. Uh, I, I, okay. was, I, I was having a problem with the microphone, so I... I... No, no problem. Okay. Okay, Let... thank you. Okay, thanks, Daniela. Thanks for having me. I would like to, to thank to the old CLAPS team including Georgina, Esteban, and Paula. Um, on behalf of the uh, market strategy direction, uh, thanks a lot for, for the invitation. Uh, I would like to share some, uh, some of our product. It's just a small portion of the, the development bank uh, operation. And in particular, what we are doing in the market strategy division is to offer some financial solutions for internal and external clients through the application of specialized market uh, products. Um, we are developing in the last uh, five, six years, several financial solutions. And, and the first one is to, to offer finances in currencies other than the US dollar. Um, usually all CAF uh, operations are expressed in US dollars. And even when, when as a result of one issuance in the European, uh, Japanese or Swiss markets, um, when we raise resources in other currencies, we hedge those, uh, that exposure and through swaps and, in, uh, and we convert those obligations into liabilities de denominated in, in US dollars. And naturally that explains why our loans, um, guarantees, and even technical assistances are denominated uh, uh, or used to be denominated in US dollars. Um, however, many governments are demanding uh, local currency solutions as part of their um, debt, manage uh, debt management strategies. And precisely for this reason, since 2017, we are including uh, in all our contracts a, a clause that allow all our member countries, all, all our private sector clients and, and shareholders to execute an auction and to express the regional terms uh, in local currencies or main currencies uh, different from the US dollar. Uh, we also use uh, local uh, lines of credit uh, from the domestic financial systems in order to provide financial solutions in, in, in domestic currencies as well. Um, as a complement and also part of the debt, man debt management strategies, uh, some government demand um, to convert the initial terms of our 
loans uh, from variable interest rate uh, usually was a LIBOR plus a spread and, and, and nowadays uh, suffer plus a, a spread. They, they are demanding to, to convert those original terms in, into a fixed interest rate loan. And we had just witnessed a, a historical cycle of low interest rate in the last decade. But um, just nowadays, we are starting to, to see a, a new cycle in the opposite direction. So it's, the timing is, 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 is perfect for, for do interest rate swaps and to, to hedge against uh, that uh, interest rate uh, raise that we, we, we are expecting. Uh, the third product we, we are we having been uh, uh, developing is a, a counter cyclical or, or unflexible amortization scheme. Um, usually, the, the standard loans carry a, a straight line amortization scheme, and we we have been working together with the with the authority of the of, of the Ministry of Finance in in Mexico to agree on a loan whose uh, amortization schedule is, is linked um, to the behavior of the oil price. Uh, and and in, in that sense, and under certain conditions, if the spot uh, price is below a predetermined uh, threshold, um, the payment of one of the several semi-annual installments um, could be postponed. So that allowed some more, um, you know, a, a more counter cyclical public spending and contributes to the fiscal policy stabilization function. We are also expanding this product to include uh, natural disaster events uh, and also maybe a future pandemic in, in, in all of our loans. Um, we also are, are, are developing other products in particular. Some uh, member countries are interested in, in, in to fix, not the, at a specific level, but a cap in the interest rate. Um, so they, they, they can manage sun exposure, but they want to limit it. Uh, and, and, and we can, uh, we can deal with that and, 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 and we can do that for, for the countries. And also, uh, we are we, we can offer uh, commodities a uh, hedging, and in a in a region like ours, which is very exposed to the international price commodity volat volatility, it's it's such an important instrument. Um, and in particular, this is uh, I want I, I would like to highlight this because in some occasions. Some regulatory factors prevent uh, or, or make it difficult for some government officials to contract uh, international financial auctions. So we as CAF could facilitate this process just simply by executing a, a pre-agree auction in, in our loan contracts. Um, when, when, when we are doing this, the, the client's perspective uh, is, is very important. And, and we think that with the development and, and depth of the debt management strategies, uh, those strategies require that multilateral banks uh, develop and accompany them and improve the, the efficiency of those strategies. Uh, and we think that our new debt management tools can contribute to this need and uh, to meet uh, this need. Um, the second thing we, we within the clients are 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 having in, in their perspective is uh, they are enhancing their, their credit profile. And as I mentioned, we are a region strongly exposed to the volatility of international um, commodity price prices and um, with the our uh, hedge, uh, the countries can reduce the, the currency or interest rate uh, exposure or mismatches. And also they can uh, complement to face uh, or to reduce some financial stress situation and, and relieving you know, the debt wave in, in some specific uh, moments and times. And, and also we allow to, to 
to ease some country restrictions that, as I mentioned, some officials in the regions face, in particular, uh, you know, our control areas are, are, can prevent or make make it difficult for, for some governments to, to contract international financial auctions directly. Um, so we, we facilitate that process uh, of paying as, a, as I mentioned before. So for our perspective, I think we, we are, um, you know, we, we, we have a simple and flexible structure that allow to cover customized requirement and, and to came out with, uh, with, with some solutions and Doing that, we are increasing our, our position as a, uh, as a strategic ally uh, in the region. And as, as I will comment in, in, in some slides later, uh, we strongly believe that encourage our competitiveness and, and, and added value as a development bank in, in the region. Um, many of these operations uh, are, um, the first transactions we we were making with with our member countries, and historically the the, the relations, especially with the sovereign sector, was uh, mainly focused on standard loans in USD that denominated. And um, but as we are innovating and doing these transactions for the first times, we can we're learning and we can replicate those innovative cases. In, in other countries. And, and a, a way to summarize this is we, we are creating additionality for the shareholder. Uh, let me show some financial solutions that we are uh, putting in practice in, in the last two years, especially in the pandemic uh, COVID uh, uh, context. Um, as I told you, uh, we, we work with the Mexican authorities in a uh, policy-based loan, which includes uh, an, um, a flexible amortization schedule associated to the oil price fluctuation. And uh, it was the first operation that includes uh, a, a clause of this type. And, and from, from that operation, another countries and another development banks are including uh, this scheme. Uh, we, in the case of Colombia, we, we have been um, uh, very active uh, uh, in the last two years. We, we have uh, executed uh, four interest rate uh, swaps in sovereign loans. Um, in, in, in Peru, we have uh, provide countercyclical financial in domestic currency using some uh, development uh, domestic banks. And the case of Brazil, uh, we have made the our first cross-currency swaps uh, in all the region with uh, um, the state uh, development banks and uh, with a focus on some regions of the country. And uh, we also develop a product in Paraguay associated to the price of soybeans for um, to, to allow a, a, a flexible repayment, similar to the case of Mexico, but, it, but, it, but uh, for soybean price in the case of Paraguay. And in the case of Uruguay, we, we, we did also an operation uh, with the, an interest rate swap in, in a sovereign loan. And in terms of the amount, we, we have, uh, ex we have uh, executed $1.8 billion in, in, in transactions of these types in the last two years, just for the interest rate swaps and 200 millions in the case of cross-currency swaps. Um, some, some advantages that the mechanism that we are implemented uh, have is that uh, many of these operations are, are similar to, to trade a derivative, but um, without the, its operational complexity, without an ISDA, which usually required requires uh, a high amount of resources or collaterals or, or mark to market. It's just an auction in our country. So it, it's, it's, it's easy, simple, and, and, and effective. And, and the second thing is the, the transparency and, and, and the, the efficiency. Uh, it's just uh, an auction and, and country member countries and private sector clients they take advantage of, of the 
balance, the CAF balance sheet and, and, and the, the risk rating level CAF, CAF has, which is uh, better than any of its member countries and with the section of, of, of Chile. And also uh, they can take member countries and private sector clients can take advantage of, of global or local opportunities and they execute that auction in, in, in their contracts uh, very rapidly. Um, so it's, it's just, as I mentioned, uh, an auction in our contract. Let me present now just a transaction here in Colombia. It, it's uh, the Colombian Prosperity Program, which uh, tried to strand the development of the Colombian, Caribbean, and Pacific region, and also the border with Venezuela, Santander, and, and North Santander zone. And we are trying to, to facilitate with this program to, to finance uh, many infrastructure projects, including uh, roads, electricity, but also social infrastructure, water, sanitation, uh, education infrastructure in, this, uh, in these regions. But we, we face a, a challenge in Colombia uh, associated with the uh, the term the, uh, in the in the medium term, the, the the local the domestic bank is pretty competitive, especially when the term is less than ten years and the grace period is around two years. Um, but the, the the local bank doesn't local banks don't um, cover the financing segment with a period greater than than than, than ten years. And also the, the national governments uh, pay a spread between 60 and 200 basis points uh, in comparison with the Republic in the secondary uh, market. And, and also the national governments, they, they were so reluctant to, to take debt in foreign currency due to the exchange rate uh, risk and the impact uh, or, or the potential sanctions they, they could face for, for the uh, control organisms. Um, so we came out with a solution similar that, uh, that, that I presented before. And we offered the Prosperity Fund offer a, a, a sovereign loan to until 25 years term and six year grace period, but it's denominated in local currency through a cross-currency swap, the, the subnational governments in Colombia exchange the original terms uh, denominated in US dollars, and they express those terms in, in Colombian pesos. So we are just starting with the program, but let me show that uh, uh, through yeah, our, I'm yes. It's, this, 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 because we are already, uh, um, the, I think as I, my, my calculations, the next session uh, should already have started. Sure, this is the, my last slide. And, and just the, the, the yellow point shows that we are very competitive in the in comparison with the, the domestic benchmark. And again, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a financing in Colombian pesos, which solve uh, one uh, problem here. And, some basic remarks is that the, uh, our new product developments position CAF and uh, as a strategic player for our member countries and shareholders in general, providing innovative solutions and in an efficient, simple and low cost uh, manner. And expanding implementation of risk management tools will allow borrowers to improve their liability management uh, strategies and that's a, it's a way to contribute to their capacity to respond more effectively to development changes, challenges. So yeah, I finish here. So again, thanks a lot for, for your time and, and for having me. Um, many thanks, uh, no, really uh, very interesting. So many products uh, that you have and how, I think the um, experience of CAP shows how financial innovations could be used for uh, a good uh, outcome, not, not only to, uh, for speculation, but also for development finance. Uh, so really very interesting how this 
this issuance in, in domestic currency using derivatives. And then uh, uh, really very, very interesting. Um, then I think that we needed to, to close the section. Uh, I think I, I would uh, have uh, more questions for you, but I think that uh, unfortunately we, we don't have time. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much uh, uh, to Diana, Miriam, Federico, Janina, and Abelardo for those very interesting presentations, and to Daniela for chairing uh, the session on regional national development banks and innovative financing mechanisms. So thank you very much. Uh, and uh, as Daniela said, because we're running a little bit late, we're going to cut to the quick uh, and uh, go to the next uh, panel on uh, productive development, structural change, and international capital flows, which will consist in a presentation by Alberto Bota, uh, followed by uh, three discussants, uh, Professor Luis Carlos Presser Pereira, Ignacio Perrotini, eh, eh, I'm sorry, Katiuska King and Ignacio Perrotini. Uh, I will introduce properly the discussant when they're, they, when they, it's their time to provide comments on the paper. And we will start with uh, Alberto Bota and the presentation of the paper. Uh, while uh, Alberto, Alberto puts up the, uh, his PowerPoint for the presentation, I will introduce him. Alberto Bota is Associate Professor of Economics at the University of Greenwich and member of the Institute of Political Economy, Governance, Finance, and Accountability. And he's also a member of the scientific committee of the master's program in cooperation and development of the University of, uh, of, uh, of Padua. So uh, I'll give the floor to Alberto. Uh, Alberto, you have 15 minutes and I'll be fairly strict uh, with, uh, with the time view of, uh, of, of just to provide, you know, just to allow for the for a discussion and maybe we can have sort of a general discussion at the end if there's time. So the floor is yours. Okay, thank you, Esteban, for the uh, introduction. First of all, can you all see me and hear me? Okay. Yes, we can hear you and see you. Can you all see me and hear me? Yes. Perfect, perfect. And um, first of all, thanks you all for the invitation. It is really a pleasure being here with you. Let me share my <clears throat> presentation. And please let me know if you can see it. Here's the presentation. Um, maybe you should first turn of off the, all, the, the, maybe um, you can turn uh, turn off the camera I so you get better better connection. Say that today I will present a shared work together with Giuliano uh, Tushiro Yajima and Gabriel Porsile, who are both here. Ah, yeah. Yeah, I will second. Mm. Okay. I present a shared work together with Giuliano uh, Toshiro Yojima and Gabriel Porcile, who are both here uh, with me. The um, topic of this presentation is the relationship between uh, productive development and capital flows, and the four implications of the research project together with. And this is the outline of uh, the uh, research and also of the presentation. First of all, I will say... Sorry, we're having um, um, we're having some difficulties trying to just give us uh, 
ask for your patience just to if we can solve these difficulties. He now hear me. Esteban. We can see your oh. lights and we can hear you now. It's okay now. Okay, perfect. Oh, perfect, perfect. Uh, sorry, there, I didn't, okay, okay. Sorry for the disruption. There's a the connection is not working perfectly today. So I will try to do my best uh, and be as quick as possible in the 15 minutes. Um, so, um, the, the codes of uh, uh, persistent productive uh, underdevelopment, and in particular the role of large capital flows uh, that say periods of financial bonanza in giving rise to premature industrialization. We will focus on international credits, which are the most volatile components of international capital flows. And then we turn it again to the role of external macro potential policy, not only as a macro um, tool for stabilizing the macroeconomy of uh, developing and emerging economies, but also as a policy tool to be integrated together with industrial structural change of those. We cannot hear. Just hold on for a second, we're trying to solve the problem. Thank you. Uh, I'm trying to I'm trying to switch to a better connection because apparently today is not working at all. Huh? Uh, sorry. Yeah, Alberto, if it doesn't work with the PPT, maybe you can provide an oral presentation of the of the results also. Okay. If he can, Esteban, present, if, if it is the same for you, I can uh, show the I can show the presentation while yes. uh, Alberto is speaking. Okay. Yes. What so are you give doing, me, please? If you can. Okay. All right. 
One second. Okay, can you can you see my screen now? Yes, we can see your screen. Okay, so uh, I don't know. Shall we wait for? Uh, I think Alberto is still there, so perhaps he can continue the talk while I I I keep uh, I keep showing the slides. Okay, uh, if he can connect, I would suggest maybe that you can present since you're his co-author. In interest of time. Okay, so I can I, if it's. If it's okay for Alberto, because I think he's still there. Uh, okay. Well, uh, I will, I will wrap up from the. I would wrap up from where where he started. That is the. I was he was present as I understand he was presenting the he was, pres, he was writing the outline of the presentation. So yeah, I mean we were our research interest was mainly uh, on the production and uh, development and economic impact of COVID nineteen. So in particular, focusing on the, uh, um, perhaps this is better. Okay, we're focusing on the effect of, uh, and on the, on the linkages actually between large capital inflows and premature deindustrialization. And in particular, not, on, not on, on a specific item of the, of, of, uh, the financial accounts, that is the rule of, of, uh, of portfolio international credit. So, the idea, uh, the idea, uh, the, our mainly the research, research industry was trying to capture the impact of those uh, of those latter of those latter inflows in order to grasp better uh, their impact on uh, the uh, on the on uh, open and uh, open emerging and developing economies, and at the same time frame better the uh, frame better the macro macro prudential policy in a uh, longer term perspective okay so uh, again why productive structure matters in time of covid-19 so first of all we do we did have a, an heterogeneous economic effect of covid-19 between developed and uh, emerging developing economies and also among the uh, larger group of emerging and developing economies themselves so we will have we, uh, we did had uh, some economic effect of covid-19 talk talk which were uh, Quite talker, uh, talker in countries and region with relatively poor, non-diversified productive structure. Yet, for instance, take the case of the uh, Latin American and South Asian and South Asian countries. Well, uh, four particular aspects stands out. We 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 did had a larger informal sector with respect to GDP, uh, with respect to uh, developing uh, developing economies, and at the same time. Uh, at the same time, we we had a, a heavier reliance upon, uh, say, contact intensive or uh, low skill industries, such for instance retail, transportation, and hospitality uh, hospitality sectors. And at the same time, we did had a, a lack of diversification toward, towards high high tech manufacturing sector or and or tra uh, tradable high skill services, which I mean it doesn't. Oh, they, they definitely also uh, they definitely played a uh, a role, and finally, a higher exposure to price volatility in primary commodities. This is some um, uh, um, a set of style side which uh, um, has been uh, uh, has been stressed uh, during the during these two day seminars, and uh, at the same time. Uh, uh, at the same time, uh, if productive underdevelopment exacerbated the economic cost of COVID-19 and, and structural changes fundamental for sustained and sustainable post-COVID recovery, except for instance, when we should record the current emphasis on moving to a digital and green economy, if all of this is necessary, first of all, uh, it is, uh, it, it, we need to understand the causes of productive backwardness. Which of course may may play a role not only in a, in an emerging and developing uh, countries context, but also in some part of the on some region of the developing uh, uh, countries themselves. Like one for, may take into account uh, the uh, peripheral eurozone countries and uh, find some similarities among uh, among uh, some situation of the of the emerging and developing countries. 
So in this paper, we merge together and uh, develop two lines of empirical, uh, of empirical analysis related to this uh, fundamental research question. That is the literature about premature in the industrialization, which has actually, let's say, a long, uh, uh, a long tradition, which was revived in a way by Rodek in a seminal paper of 2016. And at the same time, the literature about periods of large capital inflows and changing the structural composition of recipient economy, which in a way is also as also a say uh, a uh, huge uh, uh, huge literature uh, behind this. But at the same time, it was in a way, revived by uh, by some well-known uh, uh, well, uh, scholars and produced uh, scholars such as, uh, Benigno, such as Benigno and Austria and others. So we idea we uh, what we did in uh, coming to coming to our to the core of our contribution, we provide some empirical evidence on the relationship between premature industrialization in uh, de in developing and uh, emerging uh, and emerging and uh, uh, in both in developing and emerging and developing economies, following uh, uh, a stream of literature uh, which has been put forward by also uh, uh, well, by Gabriel Palma, by Fiona Tergenna, the already mentioned Rodic, and also Castiglia Neto. And uh, in particular, we took uh, the empirical approach of uh, Rodic, which uh, checked the, let's say, the, the term, the the structural determinants, uh, or the basic structural determinants for premature de de industrialization by regressing manufacturing uh, manufacturing uh, shares, or in, both in terms of GDP and employment, uh, over some structural factors. Let's say GDP per capita, and in particular GDP per capita and population, both in uh, both uh, say in level uh, of uh, in. Uh, in levels and at the same time in square terms in order to capture, say, this pump shaped uh, pattern of the, industri the, the industrialization. And uh, in particular, Roderick was um, having first defined this, uh, this let's say, basic, uh, basic framework. He tried to uh, check the existence and of, uh, of the industrialization by, in the, by including a series of dummies uh, dummy variable for different decades, for instance, the 60s, the 70s, the 80s, the 90s, and the early 20s. Um, although this contribution did provide some really interesting uh, uh, stylized facts on this uh, on this phenomenon, actually it didn't did really uh, add uh, uh, some to a theoretical explanation to this uh, to this uh, to the, uh, to this phenomenon to this phenomenon that were that this phenomenon that were facing both developing and and uh, and uh, emerging and developing economies and uh, for instance they, he didn't control he didn't have a control uh, for uh, trade liberalization natural resources course and international capital inflows so starting from uh, our basic framework in which uh, uh, we uh, we in which uh, we first try to capture which may uh, the, the possible channel to surges in foreign short term capital flows to changes in the long term productive structure and also uh, which can be the channel for this to premature possible premature decentralization we uh, uh, we um, we capture basically four, uh, let's say four of this channel. The well-known uh, financial Dutch disease phenomenon, uh, which uh, is uh, basically the rare appreciation and pro the angle domestic uh, and the rare appreciation caused by this uh, the, the surge of this, uh, this financial flows and the following crowding out of domestic tradable versus and domestic tradable in, against non-tradable sectors. And the so-called balance sheet effect, which in the end, actually, yeah, of course, actually the financial disease will act uh, in, as a, in, a, in a negative way, whereas the balance sheet effect, in a way, may act uh, in the may, may act uh, may, may act in a uh, may act positively. That is, through uh, foreign exchange appreciation, uh, the mm, a more solid balance sheet in uh, for fear for exporting fear. May 
may show up and they provide more incentive to invest. And this, but, and this also connects in a, somehow to the, uh, the, the third channel we identified, that is the Minsky instability effect. That is the fact that since firm tends to have a, uh, tend to have a stronger position, tend to per perceive uh, in a, uh, a more solid, they started to take on more risk and more riskier and uh, and uh, more riskier more riskier positions, especially in, the, in terms of uh, in terms of their balance sheets. And so they may end up in uh, pawns in uh, from they move, may move to speculative and pawns and pawns financial position. And there is also a fourth channel we uh, uh, we identified, even though we didn't uh, we, we couldn't really uh, we couldn't really. Uh, find out which may be uh, the uh, which can be which could be the the final effect that is the the credit channel that is large capital inflows and domestic credit large capital may also feed the domestic credit boom and uh, uh, relative central allocation available to funds and this also may be a positive effect but also maybe also in terms of speaking in terms of the Minsky Minsky and in Minsky content may also feed up uh, a also that may eventually uh, be uh, detrimental for the economy. So uh, moving on, and uh, well, I think I will mm, moving on to our to our framework. As I, as I told you, we build up upon the Rodic framework that I showed you before, and uh, explore whether premature industrialization that Rodic actually that Rodic detected but actually didn't explain may also be due to uh, periods of financial bonanza. And uh, we also uh, look at multiple indicators for productive development. That is, we also, we add into, we add into, uh, we tested this hypothesis either for manufacturing, nom for nominal and real GDP share, manufacturing employment share, uh, and in particular, uh, our something that, uh, something that in a way is different, although it tends to capture in this in literature the same phenomenon, that is the economic complexity index by Hausman and Yardo. Uh, and we also extended even further our, uh, our analysis by using direct data about, uh, about some times of capital inflows. So we, we instead of having instead of having uh, uh, instead of measuring the uh, in terms of having a control only in terms of dummy for periods of uh, financial bonanza we also use the straight uh, observation from uh, uh, directly taken from financial account uh, from financial account data to test if they, they does have the same effect the same effect at least on the same day under the same sign on uh, manufacturing uh, or man manufacturing shares, and uh, and we also uh, in a in a in a further development of our work, we also used a uh, um, uh, um, a direct measure of the financial account. Also, not only taking into account portfolio flows, but also uh, uh, foreign direct investment as well. So we estimate the following regression, and I mean, I think perhaps the most important part, most important and part of our contribution may be identified as uh, uh, for this dummy. That is the dummy that identifies the large capital inflows and uh, or period of uh, financial uh, or financial bonds. And uh, how they are identified? Well, they are basically to respect three conditions. The first one that net non-FDI capital inflows should be not negative or equal to zero. The second one that the positive values should last at least for three years in a row. And the third one, that the sub-period average should be either than full period country specific average adjusted, that is increased by the 10% of one standard deviation. So in order to, again, to, to find properly, properly whether in that specific uh, uh, period, the country, was, uh, the country was undergoing this uh, financial uh, this uh, episode of uh, financial uh, financial of uh, financial bonanza. So we include also additional control, as I was uh, as I was mentioned before. That is the trade openness, uh, the great the rate of growth of the rest of the world, and uh, the index uh, the and the index of uh, dependence of natural resources, which will actually will be uh, the share of uh, natural resource rents on GDP. Uh, on GDP, which are measured developed by the World Bank. 
And we consider a sample of 36 developing and emerging, de and emerging developing economies countries from 1980 to 2017, uh, which closely resembled the one of, uh, of Norway. We could have more, we could have uh, had more say, uh, countries and add more uh, and also regions, but we decided to stick to the original as much as possible to the original data of Roderick in order to provide a better comparison, which is uh, with, uh, with respect to his, uh, his original model. And we use, uh, we use OL, uh, OLS panel correct standard error estimator in order to control for heteroskedasticity out of resolution and uniforms. So this will be perhaps is the, perhaps is the most interesting one, the, the results for the manufacturing employment share. And for both for the, and we also split, as you can see, the results either for uh, the entire panel and for emerging and developing economies and developing economies. And as you can see, uh, uh, clear, uh, something really interesting stands out that is the negative impact of this financial boom damning for the uh, manufacturing, uh, for the manufacturing employment share. So we do have uh, a control for the, let's say, the structural uh, factors identified by Roderick, which are uh, which behaves uh, in a more which behaves in the same fashion as one of the spec. That is, you have the first uh, the level that is positive and the square that is negative, and uh, we also and as you can see, as you can see, this is something uh, also adding uh, as a control. Uh, for instance, uh, also the trade, uh, the great, the rotator rest of the world, and total natural resource rents, we still have a very, uh, um, very strong and uh, significant effect, a significant effect of the financial boom down. So signaling that effectively for the entire, both the entire panel, but uh, most of all for the emerging and developing countries, there is a negative effect of this financial bonanza to all. Uh, to the uh, manufacturing employment share that perhaps plays plays out through the four channel that we have identified before, and uh, same result applies for the uh, uh, for the manufacturing nominal value added share, and uh, the real um, whereas we do identify the negative effect for the really uh, manufacturing real value added share, but. Uh, in this case, was not significant. Um, this is, it is something perhaps that Gabriel uh, may, may say something about it, perhaps has something to do with the data itself. That is, in, in particular, on uh, the kind of pillar used to, you know, to, obtain, to obtain the real, uh, say, the real, mano, uh, the real GDP values for this, uh, uh, for this variable, for, for this variable. And moving on, uh, moving on to the economic effect on the complexity and the, the productive structure, even a, a, a even stronger effect stands out. So for both, and in this case, and this is something that I don't, I didn't, I didn't pay attention to, to it for the previous, but you probably have, uh, you may have noticed that the negative effect of the dummy variables uh, wasn't, I mean, some, sometimes, sometimes wasn't there and sometimes uh, was, uh, sign was uh, not significant at all for developing economies. But in this case, also take into account the developing economies, even though the effect of the dummy is uh, significant, is halved, it is still, it is still, uh, neg uh, it, is neg it is still negative and significant. So perhaps this one is, is uh, it merely, could merely be the, uh, I mean, the, uh, or an alternative, uh, alternative uh, way to view the same uh, the same phenomenon. That is, we are still we are uh, we are uh, we are as, uh, we are observing an, a process in which uh, uh, in which really we are in uh, in which uh, the um, the structure of the economy is moving thanks to those uh, those, those portfolio to a short term portfolio so in moving to. Uh, to some uh, spins, uh, to so to some uh, sectors which are mainly, uh, rent, say, rent uh, rent seeking sectors, and in this case we are reducing the complexity of the economy, and possibly we will also reduce the effect on. Uh, uh, we will also reduce uh, more. Uh, uh, we also the share of, uh, uh, of sectors that instead tend to be uh, more important for uh, uh, for long run uh, for long run development. 
And uh, again, uh, in order to verify further whether the construction of financial dummy variable has influence in any way of our results, there may be some kind of homogeneity in there, we run again a model using straight data about net portfolio and capital inflows. And in general, our, our findings are generally uh, confirmed by this robustness check. Uh, as or increases in net capital inflows always exert a statistical significant and negative effect of manufa on manufacturing GDP and also and both and also economic complexity. So I think uh, I think uh, I'm running out of time. Yeah. So can you, can, can you wrap it up, please? Thank jump. you. Yeah. So I will jump to the to our to the summary of our findings. So as I, as you, as I show you, uh, the large capital inflows always, uh, always display a negative and statistical significant correlation with our measure of productive development for the full sample and for emerging and developing economies. And as I told you, the real manufacturing GDP share, the correlation may negative, but it is still, but it, it is uh, insignificant. And uh, the negative effect is uh, much stronger in emerging and developing countries than in developing ones. Although, um, although there may be, uh, although it is still remain uh, in a, um, it is really remain negative. And this again, this uh, connect to what I was saying before. That is, in some kind, some parts of the developing, or some regions of the developed countries still may suffer from the same, uh, f the same uh, uh, phenomena. That uh, undergoes the, uh, the, the undergoes emerging and developing economies, and uh, our results are generally confirmed uh, use of, uh, with our robustness check, where we use the original data about non-FTI net capital inflows, and uh, and uh, there is a still degree of uh, uh, and. Uh, and as the, to the economic significance, the periods of large capital inflows could lead to a reduction in manufacturing shares on the or on the economic complexity index in order of the three, four, three slash four percent. And uh, so, I mean, there, there is still a high um, uh, an impact of those uh, uh, periods of bona of financial bonanza to our uh, to our uh, to our uh, endogenous variable. So, so yeah, um, I think uh, well, we did that also. Um, perhaps I can go, I can go faster on this. And so, in order, in order to you know to try to uh, tame the effect of those uh, of uh, those uh, portfolio uh, speculative portfolio inflows, perhaps one uh, one. Uh, one can think in terms uh, of, uh, of you know, one can frame the um, yeah the uh, macro prudential policy with a name of the structure of a with a name uh, with a, with a paying attention to the uh, structural composition of the economy. So, for instance, one can uh, either think in terms of economy-wide horizontal measure. With this, uh, with maybe the of course, what we when we think about macroprudential policies and uh, in particular capital uh, capital uh, capital control measures, one can think either in terms of a quantitative object, so a quantitative limit to external borrowing, and but also in I think we believe where one also uh, pay attention on the sector specific measures. So both in terms of, uh, so this can be framed either in the sector specific reserve requirements for foreign borrowing or sector specific taxation or portfolio financial capital inflows. In order not only to, uh, uh, I mean, to impose a uh, uh, top-down uh, top uh, uh, quantitative, uh, quantitative cap on this, uh, on this flows, but also trying to uh, Either uh, yeah, either enter into the sector into the sector specific uh, to the and, and, uh, the sector specific uh, uh, the sector specific effect, and at the same time trying to uh, change the composition of this flow and uh, redirecting towards. Uh, so not only not not just providing a barrier, but also trying to use this barrier uh, construct some uh, some more uh, use uh, use this barrier in order to channel it to. The most productive sector, so the, those sectors that produce hard currencies and can also help to uh, relieve the balance of payment constraints of these economies. Uh, 
So thanks for the thanks for your patience and sorry for the for the slight uh, uh, for the slight delay in the presentation. And we look forward for your question, comments, and suggestions. So I will stop my presentation. Esteban, we can hear you. Thank you for your paper. I think your paper will generate a lot of debate. Uh, I, I'm going to introduce the first uh, discussant, uh, Professor Luis Carlos Bresser Pereira. He did some introduction, but just in case, uh, Professor uh, Luis Bresser Carlos Pereira has uh, a tremendous amount of experience both in academia and at the government level. Uh, at the government level, he was Minister of Finance of uh, Brazil. Uh, he was also Minister of Federal Administration and Reform of the State, Minister of Science and Technology. Uh, in academia, he is Emeritus Professor of the Getulias Vargas Foundation, where he teaches economics and political economy since 1959, and is the editor of the Brazilian Journal of Political Economy that he founded in, uh, in 1981. He has received many awards, among which are uh, the... Uh, Dr. Honoris Causa by the University of Buenos Aires in 2010, the James Street Scholar uh, in 2012 from the Association of Evolutionary Economics, and in 2015, the Jugapato Prize from the Brazilian Union of Writers. He's published uh, many papers, and uh, currently, I think, if uh, I'm not mistaken, he's the uh, founder of actually the person has provided the, the basis for uh, the new developmentalism. So, uh, Professor Bresser Pereira, you have 10 minutes and the floor is yours. Oh, thank you very much for the invitation, uh, Esteban. Uh, I, I didn't read the, uh, the paper of Bata, Yajime, and Pusil, but I thought it very interesting. I, I look for it uh, because he has some points that are very uh, relative uh, to what I am going to say. Uh, they speak on prematurely deindustrialization de uh, and they speak about uh, uh, high domestic capital flows, uh, capital flows, in, in, uh, in, high in, uh, domestic uh, inflows, capital inflows, large uh, capital inflows, and the Dutch disease, which are uh, in, new, in, in new developmental theory, the two basic reasons why the exchange rate tends to be overvalued in the long term. And when this happened, uh, the economy, uh, the, the, the competent companies, the capable companies that utilize the best technology available uh, become not competitive. Uh, and you have, if the country was already industrialized, as was Brazil, he gets deindustrialized. If he was not yet industrialized, but was ready to become industrialized, he will not do that at all uh, due to this overvaluation of the exchange rate. So, and in this, in this, um, my, my, my understanding is that, and I, I asked to, to speak first, uh, it was excellent because in the panel, because I think I'm going to have a dissent view. Not so, so, so dissent after I, 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 I heard the, uh, the presentation of about uh, Yashima and Pusili. The Because I am uh, against developing countries having as policy to incur in current account deficits, or in other words, I am critical of, of countries, developing countries adopt a gross with foreign indebtedness or foreign savings policy. I believe that finance is essential to growth, but domestic finance, not foreign finance. 
Uh, the argument that developing countries lack sufficient domestic savings to assure domestic finance is widely shared, but in my view, false. Most countries that were successful in their growth projects use domestic, not international finance. This, uh, the companies were financed with the country's money, not with foreign money. The case of China is definitive on that matter. In 40 years of record rates of growth, only in three years, China incurred in current account, current account deficit. We must consider to, to understand why I am critical, why, why I don't agree with the inability of countries to finance, finance their own development. First, I just remember that are not savings, are not previous savings, but are financial institutions that provide finance to investments. <laughs> this is obvious, but uh, not, does not seem so obvious when you hear people. Uh, second, that the limit that the financial institutions have in providing credit to investment is for employment, because only in that moment uh, you have demand inflation. And uh, I think that the recent quantitative experiences uh, are also definitive about this. I follow many times, 40 years ago, I was fighting against monetarism uh, and developing a the theory of inertial inflation. Uh, and now I see you know, uh, this quantitative easing confirming the absurdity uh, involved in monetarism. There was a, a panel on international development banks. For me, they are welcomed if they finance investment projects in local money, not in dollars, euros, or whatever. Well, although knowing that developing countries are capital poor uh, or lack domestic savings to finance investments, I believe first that countries that achieved a level of economic development that can be and can engage in its own industrialization or countries that previously industrialized but in the last 30 years have experienced the industrialization, these countries should reject growth with foreign savings indebtedness or foreign savings policy and build domestic financial systems to finance investments. I, I believe that in most cases, this policy of trying to grow with foreign savings or, or, or foreign indebtedness, this policy is not helpful, but harmful to development. It does not promote economic development in the country, but rather hinders or impedes it, while it encourages consumption. This policy supposes developing countries incur what I'm saying, uh, suppose countries incur deliberately in chronic current account deficits, thus exhibiting long-term net capital, uh, exhibiting a net capital inflows and, and this net capital inflows in the long term for many years, which are supposed, that according to the defenders of this uh, policy, which is, that you will finance investment. Actually, what they finance is consumption. Only in very exceptional cases, they really finance investment. I say deliberately, current account debts, uh, you can say that current account debts are deliberate, or you can alternatively say that they are structural. Uh, they are a consequence of the foreign constraint. So, the, this explanation says that, uh, and, and this idea of a structural foreign constraint, uh, uh, the structural limit, 
Uh, this structural condition that fo that forces countries, developing countries, to have a current account deficit is equivocated. It's a false claim. Because uh, there is a foreign co constraint. Prebish was uh, probably the the great economist that introduced this concept. Uh, there is what they call the two the two uh, perverse uh, income elasticities that are a problem for uh, developing countries, for sure. Uh, but uh, this is a problem that only will be solved when the country uh, uh, ceases to be primary, fundamentally a ex exporter of primary goods. There is no other way of, of uh, escaping this foreign country. And uh, uh, but you don't need to be uh, have a deficit. It's enough. It is a, there's a sound here in, intervening. There is a. It is enough that the country uh, have an exchange rate more depreciated than the exchange rate that would balance the current account of the country. Uh, In my view, what really explains this chronic is a combination of a deliberate policy of trying to grow with foreign savings, which, uh, which accounts with the support of liberal orthodoxy and the support, so, so uh, the support of the central countries. Uh, this is one explanation together with another exchange rate populism. Uh, exchange, by exchange rate populism, I am using Adolf Canitros, my old friend, uh, concept. Uh, he, don't, he didn't use the, the, the expression exchange rate populism, but in a wonderful paper, a 1976 paper, he showed how the exchange rate was a source of populism. Uh, the appreciation of the exchange rate. Now, let us suppose if the current account uh, deficits were not deliberate, uh, the rich countries uh, would not support, uh, you know, the current account deficits were not deliberate and the rich countries did not support them. The governments of the developing countries and the liberal orthodoxy would condemn them in the, in the same way they condemn fiscal deficits. For me, I, I cannot understand why you are always condemning fiscal deficits. No. So, uh, what, I, what, I, what I agree, if uh, you, are, you are not having a, a, a counter-cyclical policy, then the deficit is okay, this is Keynes. No? Uh, but uh, current account deficit is okay, it's okay. Marvelous, no? marvelous for the local policymakers, local for the international uh, economic community. What conventional economics suppose is that the fiscal deficits are an exogenous variable, which depend on policies uh, the government adopt. While the current account deficit is an endogenous, not depending on policy, just depending on market forces. This is what they believe. Conventional economics sees just one problem associated with chronic current account deficits. Which problem? The currency crisis, uh, the balance of payment crisis. And they believe that government can avoid this problem by limiting the current account deficit, uh, by adopting as policy the fundamental equilibrium exchange rate uh, that John Williamson proposed many years ago uh, by proposing action that, that, that uh, but having an exchange rate that's compatible with a current account deficit that increases at a rate inferior or equal 
to the rate of increase of GDP so that the foreign debt GDP ratio does not increase uh, and uh, so it does not cause a currency crisis. I don't agree at all that this is the only problem. This is a problem, no doubt. Uh, financial crisis, uh, the second problem uh, that uh, the growth with current account deficits uh, cause. Uh, in, the, in, in, the new develop, in the new developmentalism's critique, the theory of sustaining the fundamental equilibrium exchange rate is contradictory. It assumes that the exchange rate is endogenous, defined by the market, but depends on the adoption of a policy to, to limit it. More important, um, there is a second evil associated with current account deaths. They involve net capital inflows, net, uh, which represent an increase in the supply of foreign money in relation to its demand. And uh, what, the, what in, in that fact, appreciates in the long term the exchange rate. Such appreciation makes manufacturing companies and the industrial investments in, and their investment industrial pro projects non-competitive, although they use the best technology available in the world. They discourage investment and as they increase the acquisitive power of not only workers, consumer workers, but a lot of, of, of rancher capital, capitalists uh, that are very interested in, uh, in appreciated currency. Uh, this, uh, uh, this, this policy encourages the consumption of these people. In consequence, uh, the current account deaths cause the substitution of uh, the foreign for the domestic savings. National savings fall while foreign savings increase. Exception, yes, there is an exception. The growth with foreign indebtedness policy is not harmful, but helpful, increasing with investment in, what, in, not, what, in one condition, when the country is experiencing, experiencing high rates of growth. There is, or in other words, when it is experiencing a miracle. Um, because in these moments, the marginal propensity to consume falls, while the marginal propensity to invest increases, and in consequence, the rate of substitution of foreign for domestic savings falls. Well, this is what I was want to tell you. Uh, I know that is uh, uh, is a, a little, maybe a little surprising, uh, but uh, look at China, <laughs> look at Asian countries, and you see that's not so. Uh, absolute at all. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Bresser. Uh, I'm going to give the floor now to Katiuska King. Uh, Katiuska, Katiuska is full-time research professor at Central University of Ecuador. She's a PhD. She has a PhD in development studies from the University of the Basque Country. Uh, between 2012 and 2013, she was coordinator of the Small and Medium Enterprise Research Center at Flaxo. And she was also uh, from April 2010 to October 2011, Minister Coordinator of Economic Policy of Ecuador. Katiuska, you have uh, 10 minutes, please. Thank you. Thank you, Esteban, and for the invitation. Okay, I will be very directly uh, to the points. Um, I have um, general comments, and I have three specific comments and some final remarks on long term agenda that I think that is related with. Uh, what Professor Bresser Pereira represent. Um, as general comments on the on the research, I, I clearly understand that this is related with the pos possible use of uh, as the air as uh, or other resources for middle um, development countries in the context of uh, shortage li liquidity. Um, I completely agree with Esteban that the resources should be used for development and capital increase. 
uh, but we should also avoid capital flight. And um, as it happened, for instance, in Argentina with uh, IMF uh, loans. Um, I want also to, to compliment the, for bringing this empirical experience to the inconvenience of uh, financial openness in our countries. As um, a specific comments in the in the finance in the findings of the of the of the paper, um, in page 20, 23, you say that Latin American countries have highest degree of financial openness is related to restrictive fiscal policies, and it can be assumed that financial markets penalize expansionary fiscal policies, which is completely contradictory with what we are seeing now. Um, and this must be, um, must be seen as, uh, as a problem with the, the, the other panels that we already, uh, uh, that we already saw. Also, um, I saw the, the important effect of, of total natural resources rents that the, uh, has a negative coefficient, and this is important. Uh, it could be also, it, uh, it can be interesting to analyze the relation between um, the periods of large, large capital inflows and the beginning of privatizations in Latin America. Um, since uh, this happened in, in the 90s, but most part of this uh, privatization uh, was related to financial operations with debt issues. Then uh, maybe this could be uh, interesting to to include. Perez and Bernengo uh, have a paper that explains the, the, the relation between uh, premature financialization and premature uh, deindustrialization. And um, since you are using a long time series, it could be interesting to include uh, the exposure to foreign banks and the, the presence also of uh, public development banks. Uh, for uh, Latin American countries, if it's possible for 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 all, but specifically for uh, Latin American countries, with uh, about capital flow management measures. In addition to the proposals that you you, you mentioned, the taxation of capital gains on investment in equities. Um, I was thinking, why don't include the Basel rules? Uh, as uh, the Basel rules is something that, that can be used. You have the minimum regulatory capital, but you have also um, stabilization, stabilization, sorry, buffers and um, anti-cyclical buffers also. And then uh, regulatory can be uh, increased to almost uh, 13%. Um, with other colleagues, we have a proposal con a conditional integral uh, regulation with um, lines of liquidity. I could share the, the, the proposal, but um, the, the objective was to promote the repatriation of capital. And um, if it's accepted that poor people have conditionalities, why not firm? Why not banks if they are used? to channel resources. About also the um, capital flow management measures, um, I like to mention the Brazilian experience with exchange rate derivatives as a good lesson. Um, Paula and Prates have a, a, have a paper, I think Daniela is here, that they, they analyzed the, impl the implemented policies to avoid attacks on the real the use of capital uh, control, prudential financial regulation, and regulation for market derivatives. And I think uh, this may be, uh, may be interesting. I want also, as another comment, uh, mention the problems posed by fake uh, foreign direct investment. As we are talking about uh, international capital flows, we must on implication of illicit financial flows on direct or for foreign direct investment, the pass-through uh, or phantom investment with signs of round-tripping in secrecy jurisdiction, 
And um, I propose a, a term about the coca-colonization coca of savings that is related with what the Professor Bresser Pereira mentioned. And uh, this coca-colonization of saving is, uh, how the is the possibility of domestic and national savings to be disguised as external savings and receive the, all the benefits given to external investment. I think uh, finally, um, there is that I think this is not the, the, the topic of your, of your paper, but I wanted to mention and to put in the in the table that um, there, we need a discussion on industrial policy versus uh, extractive agendas, extractive uh, agendas that are very uh, common, but that are the very present in our in, in Latin America. And another another thing is that the but it's not is the, the lack of national states in Latin America with some exceptions, but um, in others we have a, a lot of uh, regionalism that is still present and uh, in Italy you you know you know well because of the of the history, uh, but we lack strong states. Uh, um, the the other thing is that the, we we are not used. To to long term um, place, um, also uh, as I mentioned, uh, fiscal incentives should have um, accountability. And finally, um, we must think which kind of capital uh, we need in an era of uh, climate change and digitalization. And this is my, my remarks uh, to be uh, fine with the time. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Katiuska. Uh, now I'm gonna give the turn to uh, Ignacio Perrotini, who's a full-time professor in the School of Economics at the Uni National University, National Autonomous University of Mexico, chair of the Graduate Faculty of Economics in the same university. He is a chief editor of the journal Investigación Económica and has published uh, in many different papers and in a wide variety of, uh, of subjects related to economic development. Ignacio, uh, go ahead, please. Uh, you're muted. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. That's so right. yeah, I, I was saying that um, <clears throat> uh, I would like to thank uh, Esteban for having me on. And and of course, uh, I would like to congratulate uh, um, uh, the authors of the paper that I will be uh, commenting on, uh, Giuliano, Alberto, and um, Gabriel uh, have put forth a very interesting paper, very rich, and and of course it would be impossible to 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 address all of the of the topics or the issues that they they touch upon in, in in this paper. But I encourage everyone to to go and read the paper because it's really full of of ideas and full of uh, uh, interesting uh, insights. So. Um, so having said that, I, I would like to, uh, to say that uh, the core topic of the paper is the link between structural change, productive development, and financial liberalization. Well, uh, as we all know, back in 1982, uh, there was the foreign debt crisis in Latin America, which affected uh, deeply all Latin American economies. And at that time, I think Latin America had two main problems. One problem was a prob a, a, an stabilization problem, a macroeconomic stabilization problem, which was a serious problem, of course. I'm not going to deny that. But there was a second problem, which was actually the most important problem, a development problem. And unfortunately, uh, the economic policy that was devised to deal with these problems only dealt with 
the phase problem. I mean, it dealt with the stabilization problem, the macroeconomic stabilization problem throughout the 1980s. And the, the main problem of economic development was put aside. I would argue that very few people put attention to this serious problem. One of them was Professor Bresse Pereira and not for nothing. He, he founded his journal at the beginning of the 1980s and in Investigación Económica, the journal I'm editing, also dealt with the same problem. We discussed this issue. And I'm very glad to read this paper, which uh, uh, um, this report, which makes the case for the relevance of structural change and productive development as the leading engine in the aftermath of the COVID-19 uh, crisis. So this is very convenient. And I think it is very important to discuss the issues they deal with they also discuss the perverse relationship between underdeveloped productive structures and the intensity of the crisis, the economic crisis. And they argue that uh, non-financial, non-FDI non net capital inflows uh, have performed a source, a source, being a source of premature industrial deindustrialization in the context of financial liberalization. So, they find in the empirical analysis that abundant capital inflows have fed perverse structural changes away from manufacturing. And they argue, argue in favor of uh, making a, a space for expansion of fiscal policy and public investment as the center of gravity of economic recovery, recovery and long run, uh, uh, long run growth, sustainable long run growth. So that I agree with. Now, let me come to one particular issue that I think uh, I would like to convey a, a, a suggestion to the authors. On page 28, they maintain that with the exception of Mexico, most of the time, Latin American countries presented manufacturing gaps that were negative or positive, but declining or a mix of both. End of quote. Well, I would like to call the author's attention to something which is perhaps uh, irrational for uh, the uh, seeming uh, puzzle of the case of Mexico, which, which apparently is a sort of outlier in their empirical analysis. Uh, I think that in the case of Mexico, we have a very different situation, a very, very different path of uh, economic development of, if you want, of the industrialization vis-a-vis -vis the rest of Latin America. With some of my co-authors, we uh, produced a paper which we call the effect of FDI on growth capital formation and productive linkages in Mexico between 1990 and 2020. And let me tell you, let me give you the main takeaways, which I think are uh, relevant for this uh, point we are discussing. And this is not to say that my, our main takeaways uh, defy or conflict with the results of uh, the, the, the authors of the paper. Quite the contrary. I think our results are consistent with what they are saying. And perhaps uh, our results uh, uh, would be, uh, I mean, uh, a way of sort of extending the empirical analysis they made. The first uh, um, takeaway is, is the following. Uh, as a result of uh, financial liberalization in Mexico, exports increased and also FDI increased, but they were not conducive to a, a larger capital formation. The second uh, uh, takeaway is that uh, uh, financial liberalization in the in the in the uh, form of uh, FDI, not so much of a, a portfolio capital inflows, led to fragmentation of most local subsectors. Third takeaway: we didn't find a statistically significant uh, relation between FDI and forward linkages. And the final takeaway. We found a negative relationship between changes in productivity and competitiveness on the one hand, and on the other hand, FDI. So this is to say that the results of the author also uh, are valid for FDI 
at least for the case of Mexico, not only a portfolio capital inflows. So I would argue that if the author were to include FDI in their uh, equation of estimation, perhaps they, they might find an explanation of why Mexico seems not to have a negative, a, a, a negative manufacturing gap. So Mexico, as a result of financial liberalization, became a manufacturing producer. Mexico did not experience a squeeze of manufacturing as a result of net capital inflows, bonanza. Why the country? Mexico experienced an expansion of manufacturing. But the case of Mexico tells you that it is perfectly possible to have FDA, FDI as an engine of growth and yet a sort of deindustrialization, which runs through a different channel rather than a portfolio capital influence. And I would like to pose a, a couple of questions to the author. So they make the case for the space, for a larger space for expansion of fiscal policy and public investment. But at least in some countries, and to be sure Mexico is one of them, uh, we need to also increase uh, the room to maneuver in terms of tax revenue collections. So I wonder whether the authors would agree uh, uh, with, uh, uh, with the fact that uh, prior to uh, uh, an important uh, way of making room for expansion of fiscal policy and public investment requires a progressive tax reforms, at least in various countries which show a very poor tax revenue collection as a percentage of GDP. And my second question, they also uh, argue in favor of macroprudential policies. Well, but most central banks in emerging and developing economies and Latin American economies to be sure, follow an inflation targeting monetary policy framework. So I wonder whether these macroprudential policies you suggest would require, uh, would require a different approach to monetary policy, or are your macroeconomic uh, macroprudential policies consistent with the same uh, uh, monetary policy framework? I, I would argue that the current, macro, macro, uh, the current monetary policy framework contradicts with the idea of controlling for capital inflows as a way of making room for a policy space, in particular for fiscal policy space, and for the maneuver of the exchange rate to uh, improve uh, uh, the speed of economic growth of uh, uh, Latin America. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ignacio. Now we're, we're gonna give uh, the uh, floor back to uh, Alberto and Giuliano. I will ask you if you can uh, answer, if you could take five minutes, because we're running half an hour late, uh, if you can answer or select the questions that you want to answer, and then you know you can we can uh, provide the emails and you can you can have a further exchange. So either Alberto, there was uh, I hope you're connected, Alberto. You can answer or Julian, go ahead. Please. Can, can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, yes. perfect. So I hope now the connection is a little bit better. And um, no, I will be very quick in the sense that uh, I mostly agree with what you have uh, said so far. Uh, <clears throat> I will pick up the uh, final point raised by Ignacio Perrottini. Well, obviously, uh, the, the idea of uh, um, external macroprudential regulation as a possible useful policy tool, not only for stabilizing the macroeconomy, but also for uh, pushing for the structural change of the economy, um, comes together with a completely different view about monetary policy as, uh, let's say, mainstream economists are used to. So obviously, in this case, we would be, I mean, uh, external macroprudential policy and the introduction of some capital flow management policies, or call them as um, for what they are, um, capital controls is precisely meant to create more space for an autonomous and independent monetary policy, poor swing developmental goals, and not only the stabilization of prices. In that respect, I would say the, all the authors agree that uh, um, inflation controls should be pursued uh, in, uh, by, by putting together income policy, monetary policy, 
and uh, and not only rely on monetary policy as the unique instrument uh, admitting it is useful for controlling inflation <clears throat> monetary policy should pursue a, a, a developmental goal uh, like uh, and the, in this respect it is very important uh, one goal should be killing the rentier uh, uh, um, charging a relatively low interest rate uh, with the goal of perhaps attracting uh, long-term uh, capitals uh, but for sure not uh, short-term uh, um, volatile ones uh, uh, giving rise for instance to carry trade so precisely the idea is uh, implementing and introducing external macroprudential policy and capital controls in order to enable monetary policy to adopt a more developmental, um, developmentalist stance. <clears throat> in terms of the case of Mexico, uh, obviously Mexico is a kind of uh, strange animal, because if you look to some data, it seems that Mexico increased the economic complexity index. It is a kind of outlier Mexico, according to the statistics, because obviously it was toughly integrated in the global value chain in some sector that apparently are medium high tech, but we all know that it is not that way. There is a huge part related to maquila, but, and this is a problem, uh, obviously, when we try to analyze Mexico through um, statistical data. I would say. Nevertheless, one of your observations is to some extent captured by our findings and also by our descriptive figures. Uh, if we look, for instance, at the beginning of the 90s, before the outbreak of the tequila crisis, Mexico is a kind of uh, peculiar because we had uh, an acceleration of those, uh, uh, an acceleration of growth in Mexico, at least with respect to the 80s. We had a surge in uh, um, uh, short term capital flows and still a decline uh, in some indicators of manufacturing development. And this is a kind of strange because, in general, manufacturing development um, indicators of manufacturing development in developing countries tend to improve during periods of high growth, either in the economic system and in internal the economic system or in the world economy. This was not the case of Mexico. So we had an, ec an economic system which was expanding, but with a relative contraction of manufacturing. So the beginning of the 90s is clearly a case uh, consistent with what you uh, spotted before and what you said before. So an expanding economic system, booming economic system, at least in the relative terms with respect to the last decade of the of the 80s and still a relative reduction in the importance of manufacturing. Obviously, because at that period, many, I would say, uh, speculative capitals were directed to other sectors with respect to manufacturing, like the real estate and so on and so forth. So I do fully agree. The case of Mexico in general is a kind of strange, again, and not that easy to analyze um, in terms of pure trade statistics or aggregate data, we should have more on the generation of value added inside the economic system. But still, there is some evidence of effectively what you said. No capital formation, no development in the tradable sector, at least to some extent, and still a detrimental effect of some capitals, volatile capitals, for the case of Mexico. <clears throat> um, I fully agree with what the other... Um, um, what the other uh, panelists said before, uh, and thank you for the, your very rich comments. Uh, I would simply say that, uh, um, yeah, of course, I mean, we didn't have time to go through all the report, uh, but obviously a part of the report which was not considered in this presentation is the idea that uh, at least for post-COVID period, uh, there, I mean, a, a big role for the public sector is expected. Um, um, the public sector and public investment could play a leading role in order to, um, uh, how to say, push for the uh, structural change and the ecological transition as well of developing countries. But in order to do so, in order to enable developing countries to do so, we obviously need to uh, reconsider uh, in general terms, uh, to reconsider completely the type of financial integration of developing countries in the um, global financial system, I would say. I stop here, then I don't know if Giuliano wants to add something on, 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 on this. And thank you again for your comments. I would be very happy to uh, give more uh, consistent feedbacks on your comments uh, via email uh, or, or in later conversation where we might have more time.
thank you thank you again for your comments uh, Giuliano do you have any comments any replies well, I basically agree with all, with all my co-authors said first of all, I just want to do a, a, fur, um, a comment on the why in the end we decided to pick up um, uh, say um, um, the a de facto indicator for uh, a de facto measure for the uh, for period of financial uh, of financial openness because it, indeed when we in, in in this literature and this is something that also 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 Katusha brought to the to the discussion there is also um, I mean one can also look for some determinants of the uh, the financial financial of the financial structure of the financial regulation. That is, of course, uh, of one can also have a look at the uh, the regulate the regulatory regulatory aspect, and at the same time, the presence or certain kind of institutions such as uh, developing banks, and um, of course, th those indicators tends to be. I mean, the the most used one is uh, perhaps the Chinito index, which is uh, in a way uh, in a, which is in in a way it just. I mean it. Will it, it has been developed and then it's been used in the literature to, to try to uh, to try to capture these phenomena. But of course, of, of course, given the fact that is uh, that uh, in a, within this indicator there are a lot of uh, there are a lot of uh, dimension. Of course, uh, what we are looking for, like for instance, uh, what may, may be interested in certain certain regulatory aspects. Or for the presence of certain uh, financial financial institution, perhaps may be misleading. So that's why we decided to stick to uh, the U, the uh, de facto indicator for financial openness rather than the the U indicator. But of course, we can discuss and we can have a further uh, elaboration on this on uh, trying to uh, enc uh, encapsulate also and try to capture also uh, um, some financial and uh, some regulatory aspect and uh, uh, also uh, aspect related to the financial structure. So thank thanks again for your suggestion. Uh, yes, thank you yes, thank perhaps you one final comment yeah, go ahead. On, on one of the questions very quickly is that one of the idea we would like to develop further is perhaps to interact the financial dummy variable together with the other indicators uh, uh, which are which may be important for developing countries like the uh, natural resource variable because in some cases uh, uh, natural resource booms could come together with uh, financial booms and perhaps they reinforce each other due to the effect on the exchange rate so this is something that we would like to consider for future development of this research uh, i think that might be this could be connected to um uh, what was uh, spotted by the um by the uh by the panelists uh interacting uh, the financial side of the story with other factors uh, both institutional and related to the economic structure of developing countries thank okay. you again and sorry for the previous disruption no problem thank you very much alberto thank you juliano for the presentation for the paper thank you to katiuska uh professor bresser pereira and uh, ignacio perrotini for uh for the comments and of course you can exchange among yourself if you have uh, if you want to continue discussing uh, these issues i would like to with no further ado just bring uh, this uh, webinar to a close uh, just to say i would like to thank very much uh, um, penelope hawkins and daniela prates for all the collaboration the support for the seminar and especially uh, Paula Scarpello uh, from the uh, ECLAC office in Buenos Aires, who provided a tremendous amount of support. And without her help, this seminar would not have seen the light of day, actually. Uh, we will send the PowerPoints uh, and the documents that we have. And I would ask, please, to fill the, uh, the evaluation. It's very important for us, because if you want to continue having the seminars, we need to have evaluations and you know what type of evaluations i'm referring to uh and uh then i i have just uh, uh some comments on the on the whole project we we will uh, we will distribute the documents that we have on the entire project and 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 also the uh the uh the web page so you can see so you can see all the work that has been done by different agents, by ECLAC, by the Economic Commission for Africa, 
by UNTAG, uh, by the Economic Commission for Asia and the Pacific on, on, this, on this seminar. So without any uh, further, you know, without any, anything else to say, I would like to bring a close, uh, I'd like to just uh, end the seminar and with the webinar and thank you everyone for their participation, their very interesting presentations, their patience, and most important, their response to our invitations. Thank you very much. And uh, we hope to see you in, a, in a, another event soon. Actually, we're gonna have another event in July and we'll see you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Esteban. Thank you. Okay. Okay, keep safe. Bye. 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 Katiuska, te envié mi correo. Thank you all for the questions uh, and the comments. Bye bye. Okay, bye bye, Alberto. Ciao. Bye bye. Have a nice evening. Ciao.